All right, and we are recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next round of our Forge online training webinars. Um, my name is Peter Bros. I'm a Forge developer advocate. Um, I'm joined here by my colleague Deepali, who will be helping um, answering your questions. And today we will be your guides for the day one topic, which is getting started with Forge development and building your first basic Forge application. For those of you who are here for the first time, we're, we've been running these online trainings in the past as well, but for those of you who are here, uh, for those of you where, where it's your first experience, um, let me just quickly explain what this event is about. Uh, we, Forge Developer Advocates, we provide all types of resources um, to help you get started with Forge, with Autodesk Forge platform and with the development using this platform. Um, many of our tutorials, especially the ones that you can see here that we um, publish on the learnforge.autodesk.io website are, I believe, pretty self-contained and are well suited for self-learning self experience, but at the same time, we do acknowledge that some customers prefer a more guided approach where we can, where, where they can actually see how, how the development is done. And for exactly for those customers, we run this online training event every once in a while where we basically show you how, how you can follow these tutorials, how you can develop your applications by following the LearnForge tutorials. Um, this time it's a four day event. Each day we will be running one specific topic in four variations, basically. Um, it'll be, there, there's gonna be two parallel tracks for Node.js and .NET programming languages for the European audience or for the audience close to the European time zones. And then there's gonna be the same two parallel tracks, Node.js and .NET for the American audience. That, that event will be starting um, in about eight hours from now. Um, and each day, each webinar will be split into four sessions. Uh, those sessions will be roughly half an hour long. Uh, during those sessions, we will explain um, a part of a step, part of a tutorial. We will show you how to follow that tutorial, how to implement that piece of functionality in your application, for example. And then there's gonna be a gap uh, roughly uh, an hour and a half gap for you to basically follow along and follow the same steps, implement the same functionality on your side. And during that time, you can collect your questions, uh, submit them using the Q&A functionality in Zoom. And when we start the next session, um, we will get to those questions, answer them, and then move on to the next step. All right. For this particular event this week, um, here's what we have prepared for you. Today, we will be looking at the basic tutorial, the basic, the very basic Forge application where you'll be able to basically upload design files, your own design files, have them processed by the Forge platform and preview them using on a, on a web page and a simple web interface using the Forge Viewer library. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll be looking at a bit more advanced tutorial that is actually accessing your existing design content in some of the other applications and products built on top of Forge, such as BIM 360 or Fusion Team. On Thursday, there's going to be a shared session for Europe. Uh, basically, it doesn't matter whether you're using .NET or Node.js, we'll be looking at the client side development for you know, how to extend Forge Viewer, how to build all sorts of dashboards. And for that, you can pretty much use any of the applications you build on Tuesday or Wednesday, whether they're implemented in .NET or Node.js. And finally, on Friday, my colleagues will guide you through a, an advanced tutorial that is actually focused on Forge Design Automation, which is a service that allows you to basically run some of the Autodesk Hero applications such as Revit, Inventor, AutoCAD, or 3ds Max in the cloud remotely and process, process maybe your designs with your custom Inventor plugin or AutoCAD scripts or, or um, Revit plugin um, remotely without having to have the applications installed locally. That'll be the topic for, for Friday. 
All right, so we're at day one, basic uh, Forge application for uploading, translating, and viewing your models or your designs. This is what we're gonna build. It's a, um, again, simple web interface where you're gonna be able to upload files and initiate their translation processing. I'll, I'll explain that when we get to that point and preview your designs um, in your own custom web application. All right, as for the sessions, again, there's gonna be four of them, uh, each one roughly 30 minutes long. Um, they'll, they're gonna be spaced at two hours um, apart. Um, right now, we're gonna start, at, uh, start with uh, the initial setup. I'm gonna explain the, the programming language runtime we're gonna use, the development environment, and you know, all things that to get you started to actually start developing your first Forge uh, application using Node.js specifically. Uh, then in the second session, we're gonna start actually implementing our server-side application. Uh, we're gonna add a couple of server-side endpoints that will be used to do things like generate, generating a token for our viewer, right? Because if you want your Forge application to be able to access data or your data or services in Forge, you'll need to authenticate yourself in, in, in certain ways. So we'll explain how that works. Then in the third session, we're gonna add a bit more functionality on the server side, uh, some server side endpoints for uploading new files and translating them. And finally, in the, in the last fourth session at 2 p.m. GMT uh, time zone, uh, we're gonna add the client side piece where we're gonna build a simple HTML page with Forge Viewer component on it and a sidebar with a, like a tree structure, right? Where you're gonna be able to list your files, upload new files and view them. All right, so let's move on to session number one. Here's what we're gonna need. First of all, before we even get to development tools and programming language runtimes, um, we're gonna need a Forge account, um, some, uh, some kind of Forge subscription. Uh, so what that means is if you wanna get started with Forge, you'll want to head over to the official Forge portal. That's the forge.autodesk.com website. Right. Um, if you haven't registered yet, if you haven't used um, Forge yet, you'll want to use the sign up, sign up button. Otherwise, if you've already registered, you can just sign in uh, with your existing Autodesk credentials. For me, I already have my Autodesk account, so I'm just going to sign in with my personal account. All right, and we're in. Now, what you'll see is when you when you log in, you'll see a section under your icon in the top right corner called My Apps. This is where you're going to be creating your Forge application. Now, what what does that mean? Um, a Forge application is basically a collection of credentials that you will be using to to authenticate yourself when, communi when communicating with the Forge platform, right? So you cannot just start asking Forge to uh, upload files for someone and you, you cannot just access somebody else's data in Forge, of course. Uh, you need to prove that you are who you claim to be, right? Um, that's what the Forge applications are for. Um, so as a second step in our prerequisites here, once you have your Forge account ready, once you can actually log into the Forge Dev Portal, uh, I would ask you to create a new application. And to do that, you'll simply use the Create App button. You can see I already have plenty of app, apps here because I'm using them to basically separate the content in Forge for different customers, right? Because I, for example, when I'm building a demo application, I don't want users of that demo app to see content of somebody else from other sample app or from another proof of concept, for example. So I would recommend you do the same. Whenever you're developing a Forge application for, let's say, for a specific user or customer, uh, create a new application to create this self-contained, secure um, area where um, the user will only see their own content and uh, nobody else will be able to see their content there. 
All right, so we'll hit the create ad button and you'll be presented with a page that looks like this. Uh, first of all, you'll be prompted for to select the API that you're planning on using. Um, I don't really think there's any problem with selecting everything, even if you for now don't envision using some of the APIs here, like the token flex usage APIs. Um, it's still good to check those because in the future, maybe you want to extend the functionality of your Forge app and um, you may use these APIs in the future. Then what you'll want to do is provide some name and description for your application. So for now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say Forge Online Training April 2021, day one, let's say. I'm going to use, um, describe it as basic Forge application. All right. Then there are two more fields um, which are required, but for now we're not really, we, we, we're not going to use them today you know, for the basic Forge application. These will, however, be important for the tutorial that we're going to be doing tomorrow where you're going to be accessing your BIM 360 content or Fusion Team content, for example. So those, for now, we can just fill them up with random, with with uh, random URLs, but keep in mind that tomorrow, uh, for those of you who are interested in building the advanced Forge app um, in our um, Wednesday session, um, these are gonna be important. And you can always come back to your app and edit it and update these URLs in any way you need. So don't worry about uh, using some weird placeholder URLs here. All right, once those are filled in, we can just finalize the creation of our app. And we're gonna be presented with these two very important strings, one called client ID and another one called client secret. These are the credentials that I was talking about, right? This is basically your username and password you're gonna be using when communicating with Forge to prove that you are who you are, all right? Now, important thing, you just like with your passwords, you don't want to share your client secrets with anyone, obviously, right? For here, since I'm sharing my screen with you uh, and I'm recording the whole thing, of course, I'm gonna have to somehow expose my, my password here, my client secret, but that's all right. What I'm gonna do is, um, as a good practice, once I'm done with my presentation today, at the end of the day, um, I'm gonna hit this regenerate button which will basically create a new random password for me. So the older one that somebody could find in my video recordings and maybe try and use to use my subscription to run their four apps, um, that password, that old client secret will no longer be valid after that. Um, so for now, again, I, I, I will expose the password here, um, but that's only because I want to show you how to you know, set your environment but you, I'd recommend you never share the client secret with anyone. It's de definitely not included in, in your code somewhere that you maybe that you're uh, pushing to GitHub or any other source control management system. All right, so we have our application ready with its um, client ID and client secret credentials. Um, that's great, now we can go back to our slides. The next step will be setting up our development environment. Um, in this presentation specifically, we're looking at Node.js, right? So as I mentioned earlier, um, we're running two parallel tracks um, for every tutorial, except the, the client side, the viewer extensions and dashboards on Thursday uh, for Node.js and .mat. Um, and in this case, we're looking at Node.js. Um, so what we're gonna need is a Node.js runtime. That is basically um, a small, package that you will want to have on your system so that you can execute Node.js scripts and run Node.js applications locally, right? Uh, Node.js is basically just JavaScript um, runtime that you can use to run not, not only your custom scripts on a web page in a browser, but you can implement your JavaScript applications and run them as basically desktop or server applications as well. That's what we're going to use here. As for versions, I would recommend using the LTS, the long-term support version. Um, and, uh, and for de development environment, you're free to use any editor you, you're familiar with or you're comfortable with. Uh, for us, 
um, we're going to use Visual Studio Code. Um, I'm a big fan of that editor. It's a basically a like small, lightweight, like a little brother of the proper Visual Studio, which is, which I consider more like heavier, you, you know, useful for like desktop app development. But I think for web development, especially, uh, Visual Studio Code is really good. Um, so if you're if you're still not decided, if you don't, if you're not, you know, strictly like a I don't know like web storm uh, person. I definitely recommend that you give give it a try. So you head head over to code.visualstudio.com and download and install the um, the stable build, the latest build. Um, now one more li little like shameless plug. Um, this is what Visual Studio Code looks like, and if you do decide to give it a try and use it for development uh, this week for uh, you know as part of our. Forge online training webinars. Um, there is this little nifty thing that might be really helpful for you. Um, we have developed an extension for Visual Studio Code for people working with Forge. It's a Forge extension, basically. Um, and you can find it uh, when you have VS Code installed if you head over to the extension site panel and search for Autodesk Forge. You should find somewhere towards the top our extension with the Forge logo here. Um, this will basically add another icon to the sidebar that will get you access to your, to all your Forge content and services or to most of them, uh, right? So you'll be able to even upload your designs from here, translate them from here, open them and preview them using Forge Viewer directly inside the Visual Studio Code as well. So if you, if you do decide to, to use VS Code and you don't have this extension yet, um, I definitely um, encourage you to give it a try. So once you install the extension, on some systems, I think you may need to reload Visual Studio Code after the extension is installed before it appears here in the sidebar. You can see I already have it installed here, right? The Forge icon. Um, now, if you open it for the first time, as I mentioned earlier, when you want to communicate with Forge, you need to authenticate yourself in a certain way, right? Um, for that, uh, the extension will first check if there are any Forge credentials already configured for it. And if not, um, it'll, it'll, show, it'll use this prompt to, to ask you to enter your first Forge credentials, right? That's the client ID and client secret that we have generated um, earlier. So I'm gonna use this prompt and just say enter Forge credentials. And now you'll see it'll ask me for Forge client ID. So I'm just gonna go back to my Forge app, copy the client ID and paste it here. Now it's gonna ask me for Forge client secret. Again, that's the one that you don't wanna share with anyone, but I'm gonna share it here because I simply have to. So that's my secret password. And now it's gonna, it's gonna ask me which region I want to use to um, to store and manage my data. So for now, I'm just going to use maybe U.S. as default. And finally, um, the extension will ask me to provide some kind of recognizable name for my set of credentials because later on you can actually create additional add additional credentials and give give them different names so you can switch between these environments, right? So I'm going to use it. I'm going to call it maybe my env. All right, that's it. Now my extension is, is loaded. You can see it's already looking into Forge for my content. Of course, I have just created this Forge app, so there is nothing there yet. Um, but now I can already start doing some of those operations that we're going to be implementing in our first Forge applications today. Um, I can do these operations from here without writing any code at all, right? So I can create new buckets. I can upload files. Um, I can translate them. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you later when we actually get to the uploading phase. All right, that's for Visual Studio Code. And again, for Node.js, I recommend installing the LTS version. Um, again, on, on Windows, it's also good to have some command line or terminal environment, right? If you're on Linux or Mac OS or any Unix-based system, it's easier. You can just use Bash, which is what I'm going to be using here. Um, if you're on Windows, I believe that um, <clears throat> the Node.js runtime comes with its own Node.js uh, command prompt as well. So I'd recommend that you use that because 
we're going to use the command line just initially to set up a new Node.js application to install dependencies. Um, so some kind of command prompt. I, I, I discourage you from using PowerShell because I'm not sure how, how well PowerShell works with um, the Node.js binaries and you know the commands that we're going to be using uh, later. So either a bash-like environment, a bash-like terminal, which you can also get on Windows when you install the Git client, right? Or just use the command prompt that is that that is installed with Node.js, with the Node.js runtime. All right. Now, just to quickly recap and show you what what to what to do, where to find the the editor. Type. So again, code.visualstudio.com, just download the stable build for your platform and you're all set. And then as I said, if you're interested, check out the extensions sidebar um, and look for Autodesk Forge to install the um, Forge extension. That's for VS Code. And for Node.js org, Again, I would recommend using the long-term support version, which is currently version 14.16. That's what we're gonna be using when we start implementing our first Forge um, application, the server-side component in, in the next session. All right. And I believe that is it for our session number one. So now it's your turn. Um, again, I would ask you to create your Forge account if you don't have one already and create a Forge application, right? To generate that collection of credentials, the client ID and client secret, because we're definitely gonna need that when we move to session two, when we start implementing our server side piece for our first Forge application. And make sure you have Node.js installed, that you have um, a command line available where, where you can run Node.js commands. So let me maybe just quickly showcase that. In my case, again, since I'm on Mac, I'm gonna use a standard terminal with bash here, right? Um, and it is, in this case, I'm gonna be using a command called npm, which is basically, um, it's, a, it's an acronym, it's, it stands for a node package manager. It's a little utility that is installed together with Node.js and it's used to create new Node.js projects, to install dependencies, to manage, to upgrade versions of dependencies and things like that. Um, and then we're also gonna use Node, which is the actual binary that will execute your JavaScript code as an actual server-side application in this case. So, Whichever way you go, just make sure that, you know, you have Node.js version 14 installed. And I can actually, I can check that here as well. So I'm using uh, version 14.15, which is fine too, because the long-term version, we just want to make sure that the major number is 14. So when you run Node-V, just make sure that you're on version 14. something, anything really. Um, and make sure that you have a terminal or command prompt on Windows where you can actually, where these commands are recognized, npm and node, because that's what we're gonna use later in the next session to bootstrap our application and, and install dependencies and, and everything. All right, so now let's check the questions. Are there any tools like VS Code Forge tools extension for PHP Storm or Web or WebStorm? Unfortunately, not Vladimir. Um, so I'm not really sure. I mean, people in our team they use different editors, uh, but I'm not sure if anyone's using WebStorm. And um, maybe there might be just one person, but unfortunately. Um, as far as I know, there are no similar extensions to the one we built for VS Code uh, for other for other editors. That doesn't mean that you are basically losing, losing up on this no-code approach to Forge though, because uh, there are actually apps that might be helpful if you want to maybe quickly 
If you want to be able to quickly upload a file and maybe translate it and preview it without writing any code, like I was showing in VS Code. Um, if you don't use VS Code, you can still manage your data um, without writing any code. And that would be through some of the sample applications that we have written also. Um, there's one called oss-manager.autodesk.io. This was implemented by my colleague, Adam, Adam Nagy. And this is basically a very similar type of application. I mean, it's running on a, on a web page instead of in you know, WebStorm or Visual Studio Code, but it allows you to do pretty much the same uh, types of, you know, types of operations. So once you enter your credentials, your client ID and client secret, again, those are the force credentials. Once you enter them here and hit the login button, you will be able to do the same thing. You'll be able to create buckets, as you can see here. Um, you'll be able to list the contents of the buckets, upload files, translate them, and even view them in Forge Viewer on the right side here. Um, so again, for those of you who are not using VS Code, but would still like some no-code way of accessing their content in Forge, um, this might be another option, the oss-manager.autodesk.com. All right, another question. Um, is there a way to change the Forge credentials in VS Code after the login for setting a different user? Yes, that is possible. Uh, let me show you how. Let me go back to VS Code. So let's say now we've already configured our environment, right? Um, you can see it here at the bottom on my end. If I had more environments configured, I would see them listed here and I could switch between them. Um, now I only have one, but let's say maybe I made a typo. Maybe I used the wrong client secret or maybe I regenerated my client secret so I need to update it. Um, you can simply edit it in, uh, in settings, on, in, for, in VS Code settings. Um, on Mac, the shortcut is command comma, but I'm not sure how it's gonna be on Windows. So but you should just find it in, in, the, in the menu, right? It's preferences and settings. And here you can search for Forge and you'll see a couple of different Autodesk Forge specific settings. All these you can leave to their defaults. The one that's important is the Autodesk Forge environments, right? So uh, those, the environments are not simple strings or numbers. So they don't appear nicely in the interface like, like these properties, like these config settings, uh, but you can still edit them directly inside the the settings JSON because Visual Studio Code is basically managing all the settings inside VS Code, uh, in, inside in a, in a JSON file. So here, when I hit that edit in settings JSON, this is what I see, right? So you can see that the settings for the extension and for any other VS Code extension is just a piece of JSON. And in this case, I already have one environment that I configured earlier, but nothing prevents me from creating multiple ones, right? So I can say my environment two, and I can use maybe different, or I can just edit the existing environment, right? I can maybe use, um, if I have another customer and if I create another Forge application for that customer, I can add it here as a second one, as a second environment, right? Um, and that's it. Now I've configured my VS Code extension um, by manually editing the JSON file. Um, so now if I, if I go back, and I think, yeah, I hit the Forge environment um, item in the status bar at the bottom. You can see I'm already presented with my NF2, right? So I can easily use that to switch between these environments. Of course, now they both represent the same credentials. So it's gonna be, they're gonna show the same content. So I hope that that answers your, your question. And one more question here. My VS Code Forge extension says status code 401 could not load objects or buckets. Um, yeah, that 401 basically is a code commonly used to, to indicate that there has been some authentication problem, meaning that you are trying to access Forge with um, incorrect credentials. So typically that is due to typos um, in the client ID or client secret, right? So it could happen that if I, let's say here, if I try and edit my Forge settings again, let me delete this, the second environment and just keep this one. 
Um, and let's say I made a typo and maybe included a space or something like that, right? Um, if I reload, if I reload Visual Studio Code, if I try and use the extension, no, does it actually, oh, it may actually accept the space or maybe my code in the extension is cleaning it up. So let me try messing it up better. Oh, okay, now actually it works as I expected. So you can see now we're getting the same error, 401, which means again, authentication problem. So if you happen to get this 401 uh, error in VS Code, just go back to the settings and make sure that the client ID and client secrets match exactly the values from the forge portal, right? So this string, use that as your client ID and use a proper client secret. You can just copy it to clipboard by double clicking, double clicking the, the secret, right? So I can bring it back here again. All right, now again, reloading, reloading the window should work fine. And now, yeah, and now our Forge extension has in, initialized properly, so I can try, you know, creating a bucket. That's something again we're going to look at um, in the next session, or actually in the in the third session. So, so I can try something like, or maybe prefix it with my with my name because one thing I'm going to mention later later today is uh, bucket names must be globally unique. Um, so if you if you try to create a bucket called test and select some uh, data retention policy. In this case, I'm gonna say persistent because I want my data <clears throat> in that bucket to be kept forever or until I manually delete them. If I try and create a bucket called tests, I'm gonna most likely get an error 409, which means naming conflict. Uh, so as I mentioned, the bucket names, they're basically your folders in Forge. Um, they must be globally unique. So if you try something like test, it's very likely that somebody else had, had already created a bucket with that name before. So we typically recommend doing things like prefixing the bucket names or suffixing them with, let's say your client ID or maybe your name, right? So for now, I'm just, I'm just gonna say Peter Bross, Forge Training Bucket. That sounds pretty unique. It should be fine. Let's see. I'm gonna say persistent again. And there we are, our bucket was created. So now I can I can happily start uploading files, translating them and previewing them. There are also some limitations to the <clears throat> to the name of the bucket. So it may only include uh, lowercase characters. Be careful about that. Uppercase won't work. Um, numbers, dashes, underscores, and I believe dots. Um, so careful about the naming as well. So I hope Peter that answers your question. Um, give it a try. Um, and Vinit also mentions that, yeah, that sometimes this might be a problem with when um, using control C, control V to V to paste client ID or client secret to uh, the configuration here. Sometimes you may accidentally bring in an extra space or something like that. Um, so just go, if you head back to settings, look for forge and use the edit in settings JSON option, just make sure that there are no weird characters before or after the client ID or client secret. Thank you, Vinny. All right, that is it for now. So unless there are no other questions, um, we can hop on our please standby page and now is your turn and we're gonna be back here in roughly one hour and a half to answer your questions and move on to session number two, where we're gonna start implementing our Node.js server and some authentication logic in there. All right, I'll see you soon. All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to our Forge Online Training Day One. And um, now it's time for us to move on to session 
number two. In this session, we will implement, we'll start, start implementing the first parts of our Forge application. We'll start with the server side and basic um, scaffolding for our Node.js server application. All right. Um, I believe we have answered all the questions that were posted in the Zoom's Q&A, but if there are any other questions, if you ran into any problems while getting your Node.js um, environment running or getting the editor set up. There were some problems with the VS Code extension as well that were discussed in the Q&A. Um, so let us know if, if, you, if you ran into any other obstacles. The two typical problems that we see are either 401 errors, uh, when people try to, you know, initialize the VS Code extension for Forge and when they try creating buckets. So if, if you're getting 401s, that basically means some authentication problems. So in that case, go to your settings in VS Code. It's a large JSON file. Find the settings for the Forge extension and make sure that the client ID and client secret that you've configured um, are valid. Make sure that there are no weird spaces or other characters before or after those um, those strings. All right. And the other problem that people sometimes run into are the 409 errors. And those are basically naming conflicts. So when you try creating a bucket um, with some specific name and you get a 409 error a response, that means that somebody had already created a bucket with the same name. And since the buckets have to be globally unique, uh, you'll need to come up with a different name. All right. Awesome. So let's move to step number two. We're going to initialize our new NPM project and install some of the dependencies that the Node.js code will use. Um, we'll set up our um, launch configuration. That's for, for those of you who decided to use uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, you don't have to use that, but um, it's just a little extra layer of convenience if you want to debug, run and debug your applications, Node.js applications in VS Code. Um, and we're going to prepare a basic Express um, Node.js server. All right, let's get to that. What we're going to do now, we're going to start following the tutorial on the LearnForge website. So once again, that is learnforge.autodesk.io. This is one of our resources where we provide tutorials for um, different types of use cases. In this case, we're looking at the tutorial called View Your Models. That's the basic application where, again, we can upload our designs, have them translated, and preview them using Forge Viewer. Um, and we're going to start by building our server. Um, here you can see we also provide the complete implementation of this tutorial for different languages, for different programming languages. Um, Node.js would be the one that we're going to be using today. So if at any point during the day, uh, maybe you run into problems, um, either ask us here, we'll try and help you out. Or if you want to just be able to compare side by side your code with the existing implementation of a Node.js app, um, you can find the entire implementation of this um, demo app under this link for Node.js specifically. And here, what we're gonna do instead, we're not gonna just clone the entire implementation of this demo app. We're gonna go nicely step by step. We're gonna start by creating a server. Um, here, since we're working with Node.js today, we're gonna choose Node.js as our language. So now the first thing we need to do, as I mentioned, is we need to initialize our Node.js app, right? This is the typical first step that developers building their Node.js apps have to do. Um, we need to create some kind of description for our new project to explain um, what its name is, what dependencies it's going to use, how it can be started, and things like that. And we do that typically from a terminal or command prompt um, using the NPM um, command that I mentioned at the end of the first session. Um, so let me start my terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder in my Forge, I think I, I created and, oh wait, no, sorry, that was on desktop. 
desktop forge online training day one. And I'm going to create a new folder here. Um, the name is entirely up to you. I'm going to call it view, view, view models, let's say. So create an empty folder on your, um, on your local file system when you're following our steps. Um, you go inside that folder. And now we're going to initialize our Node.js project. What I could do is I could just type in npm in it. And that would take me through a series of questions about what's the name of the project? Who's the author? What's the license? Um, things like that. But you can actually skip that by adding dash y after npm init command. Um, this will basically skip all the questions and answer with the default answers, right? And it'll just create this package JSON file, which is the sort of a like a metadata manifest that describes our new Node.js project. Um, and it'll, it'll include the default, default settings, right? So for name, it uses the name of the folder, uses a version 100, no description, some default test script that for now just echoes a message and returns error code one, and that's it, right? You can always, of course, come back to these um, and change them as you like. But for now, this uh, for us is going to be fine. Now, the next step um, is for us to install certain NPM dependencies or Node.js dependencies, right? That's that's the main purpose of the NPM tool, the Node Package Manager, because we don't want to re-implement, reinvent the wheel, right? We don't want to start implementing a completely new server going all the way down to low level handling HTTP re requests and responses. Um, the Node.js ecosystem is extremely rich and provides lots of modules and libraries we can leverage. Um, in our case, we're going to use three packages. One of them is called Express. That is the, that is a very popular web framework for creating web applications using Node.js. So Express.js is the name of the framework and the name of the module that you can install and use in your own Node.js project is called Express. And Multer is one of the many Node.js modules that are available out there provided by the Node.js community that can help you handle um, uploading of files to a server, right? So there is some amount of work and overhead that needs to be done when you want to build a server application that can accept files uploaded to it by the user, right? So you need to handle specific content type, whether it's the X WWW form URL encoded typing or form data, uh, different types of content types, and you need to be able to parse the data from the request properly and you know retrieve the actual body of the file that's been <clears throat> that's been uploaded to you by the user by the browser. Um, so Mulder takes care of that in a, in a nice way, in a nice, easy way. And finally, the third module called Forge APIs is <clears throat> the official SDK that we provide to people who are developing their own Node.js applications and who want to be able to communicate with Forge, right? So Forge as a platform is basically a collection of web services, and we call them their REST APIs, which means that these services you can communicate with using standard HTTP requests, right? But we don't want you to have to manually prepare the complete HTTP request providing, you know, specifying the right URL, the right HTTP method, the authorization headers and the proper body of the payload. That can be, you know, you can go that low level if you want to, um, but we really encourage you to use this higher level, you know, the convenient tool that will basically just give you a class and method interface where you can call methods to to make requests to Forge, to trigger different operations in Forge. And under the hood, these methods will do exactly this. They will create a new HTTP web request every single time you call one of those methods. They will make sure that the URL is set properly, that all the headers that need to be included are included and that the payload if there is any, is of the right shape, right? So Forge APIs are the Node.js SDKs for Forge services. So you can just simply 
instantiate classes and call methods on them to communicate with Forge. So these three modules we're going to use in our application. We're going to install them using this npm install command. And to make sure that these dependencies and their specific versions are also captured in our package JSON file in the manifest, we're going to use this dash dash safe uh, uh, switch, right? Because that will make sure that these three um, dependencies are captured in our JSON, package JSON file. Now, you don't have to type them in one by one, you can actually install all the dependencies uh, together. So I'm just going to say npm install express malter and forge, a not froggy, but forge APIs dash dash safe, right? By doing that, all three dependencies will be installed, downloaded to our local uh, folder into a subfolder called node modules. And so you'll see that we now have a node modules folder here as well. Um, and if we look at the package JSON, you'll see that now we actually have the three dependencies that were added to, to the JSON file for us automatically by NPM. And it also captured the versions of these dependencies that we're gonna be using, right? So this file you can include with your source code when you send it to GitHub, let's say, so that when somebody else wants to take this code, and make sure that they install the same dependencies you were using. All they need to do is just go into this folder with where the package JSON file is located and type in npm install. When they do that, without passing in any additional parameters, this will basically just install all the dependencies listed in the package JSON file, and it'll install their corresponding versions. Here, it's not going to do anything because we already have our dependencies in the node modules folder here. All right, so we have our project, NPM project bootstrapped, and now we can move on to start building the, the folder structure and files for our Node.js server. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close the terminal here because we're not gonna need it anymore. So let me close the terminal and move on to VS Code. And here in VS Code, uh, you can just use, uh, again, on Mac, it would be um, Command-O, or I'm thinking on Windows, probably going to be Control-O, or you can just go to the File menu and say Open. And compared to Visual Studio, where you typically use like um, different solution or project files to represent solutions, the Visual Studio Code works typically just with folders, right? A folder is considered a workspace or a project workspace in Visual Studio Code. So all you need to do is just locate the folder where you um, created your package JSON file, right? So in my case, that would be view models. Um, you see that's the folder where I created my package JSON and where all my modules were already installed. This is the folder we're gonna want to open in VS Code because that's gonna be our workspace, right? That's gonna be our project. So I'm just gonna, while inside this folder, I'm just gonna say open, right? And we're here, right? We're ready to start coding. Um, just make sure, again, sometimes people accidentally stay one folder, like one level higher or go, they drill down too deep. What you wanna do is make sure that your folder where you created your package JSON file is open here in the sidebar and that what you should see here is just the node modules folder, right? Where all our dependencies were installed and the package JSON, right? You shouldn't see any other subfolders. Uh, make sure that um, when you open that folder in your VS code that it's gonna look the same. Uh, otherwise you might run into problems when you try running one of the Node.js you know, scripts and Visual Studio Code will not be able to find them because you're actually either one folder higher or one, one folder deeper, one level deeper. Um, all right, so now we're gonna start preparing the folder structure for our Forge application. Um, typically, uh, what we recommend, it's a, it's a good practice to create a folder called routes. Uh, this is where we're gonna start building our server-side endpoint logic, right? Um, in, since we're gonna be using the Express uh, Node.js framework, um, the, the Express framework uses a concept of something called a router. Router is a piece of code that um, you can attach to a specific URL. Let's say 
that your server is going to be listening on. So let's say slash API, right? You can take this piece of logic, this express router, attach it to a piece of string, in a, for example, slash API. And from then on, any request to your server to some endpoint that starts with slash API will be dispatched to this router. And we will ask the router to handle any of the specific requests that might be coming in starting with slash API. Right? So it's, it's a good practice to create this folder called routes where we can create different files for different express routers that will be handling uh, different types of endpoints. And similarly, it's also a good practice to separate all the client-side assets, right? So the HTML, the JavaScript, client-side JavaScript code or CSS styles or images. So anything that will be shared or sent by the server to the client that will actually run on the client, uh, we're going to be placing inside a public subfolder in our project. All right. So this is what your VS Code sidebar, the file explorer should look like. Again, we should have a folder open and we should just see our package JSON, potentially the node module subfolder if we already installed the dependencies, right? And two empty folders, public and routes. Now we're moving on to the launch JSON file. This is something that is again, specific to Visual Studio Code. So if, you, if you're using WebStorm or any other editor, you can, you can skip this part. But if you are using Visual Studio Code, we recommend that you um, use this functionality. Uh, this is basically uh, a feature of VS Code where you can create something called a launch configuration that can be then used to quickly run and debug your app uh, right from the uh, right from the editor, and to actually be able to attach the, a debugger to the running app, so that you can add breakpoints to your code, you can step through the code, you can you know watch variables and their and their uh, and their content and things like that. Um, if you go back to VS Code um, and you switch to this run and debug sidebar. Initially, you probably will not see anything, right? Because again, we haven't created any launch configuration yet. Um, but um, you can see here that you already have a link, a hint to create the launch JSON file for you automatically. Uh, so let's we're, we're gonna we're gonna use that. I'm gonna say create a new um, launch JSON file. You may get some some errors there because in my case, I'm, I have some additional. Uh, additional extensions available in VS Code, and they will all try and offer me their options for creating the launch JSON file as well. But here, what you should see is when you hit the create a launch JSON file, a collection of runtimes, right? Programming languages that you want to maybe choose from, right? So in our case, we want to create a new launch configuration to run our Node.js application, right? So I'm going to find Node.js on my list and click it. And that's it, right? So see, now um, we have our first launch configuration. It was called launch program by default. We can change it to whatever we like, maybe launch server. We can define which files can be skipped when, when running the app and what program should be run when we actually start this configuration, right? For this, we can go back to our, to the LearnForge tutorial website. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy these two properties in the configuration, program and ENB. Program, as you can probably guess, is what app should actually be started when we run this um, a launch configuration, right? So in our case, we're using some um, environment variables that are provided by VS Code. So it's gonna be something inside our workspace folder, right? And we're gonna run a JavaScript file called start.js. This is gonna be the main file containing our server, server Node.js logic um, that we will implement uh, momentarily. Another very nice part, um, and another nice aspect of this launch configuration is that you can also specify environment variables that should be set when the, when the program is ran. Right, this is 
crucial. This is critical because uh, in server development, especially in Node.js, it's very common to pass any kind of parameters when you need to, you know, pass in um, usernames, passwords, or credentials like the client ID or client secret. It's very common to you to pass these parameters into your app through environment variables. So if you're not using Visual Studio Code, and let's say if you want to run your app from a terminal or from command prompt, you will need to make sure that these uh, environment variables are set before your app runs. Otherwise, the app will not know which client ID and client secret to use, right? You could also hard code these values into the source code, but that's not a good practice. Um, so here, we using this ENV property of our launch configuration in VS Code, we can actually specify a list of environment variables and their values that we want to uh, be used when we run and debug our application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my to the Forge portal to my application, and I'm going to copy and paste the client ID and client secret and paste it here to a an environment variable called Forge underscore client underscore ID. And I'm going to copy the secret as well and paste it here to a similarly named environment variable. I just know I'm just going to use these Forge client ID, Forge client secret because the same names of these environment variables are used in our code when we try and read those settings before when we start our application. The last one, Forge callback URL, you can skip to, uh, for now because again, it is, this is something that is only required when you want to actually have some login functionality for your users so that they can log in with their Autodesk credentials and then maybe use your app to access their own designs in BIM 360 or Fusion Team. Today, we're not gonna be using it. So uh, you can either exclude this environment variable entirely or just leave it there with some random placeholder string. All right, now our launch configuration is ready. Um, so now if we go back to, if we go back to the run and debug um, sidebar section, you'll see that now we, we already have a list of configurations we can run. There's only one for now, the one we called launch server, let's say, right? So now if I hit that uh, play button, I could already run my app, attach the debugger and start, you know, placing breakpoints, step through the code and, you know, use all of that. Uh, coolness of like Node.js debugging. Now, of course, we don't have our code yet, so let's create it. I'm going to go back to the LearnForge tutorial and see this is where um, we're going to start building the actual server application. Instead of typing it by hand, I'm just going to copy. I'm just going to use this copy to clipboard function. And I'm going to create a new start.js file and again, make sure that you actually create this file in the same folder where your package JSON is, right? Uh, make sure that it's located, that it's not located in any subfolder or again, in, you know, in, in a weird place, right? The start JS file should be in the same folder where the package JSON file is. And I'm just gonna copy the code from the code snippet from the LearnForge website, and we'll just quickly go through what it what it's doing, right? So first of all, we're loading in some dependencies. We're bringing in the path module, which is actually built in module available in Node.js itself. And then we're also bringing in the express the, uh, module that we installed using NPM. That's the Express.js, the web framework, a popular web framework for uh, Node.js. Um, and the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna require a special file called this dot slash config. That basically means that there's gonna be another file in the same folder as start.js called config.js, where we're gonna prepare some configuration options for our app. See here, we're gonna check if, if it has some credentials property and it's client ID sub property set or client secret. And if not, we will basically just complain and stop return from the app immediately. Otherwise, we will create a new server application using Express and configure it in a certain way. What we're doing here is we're basically creating something called Express middleware. Uh, that's another concept in the um, server side development world, especially in Node.js, like the routers. Middleware is something, it's a piece of code that you can basically insert. You can, you can build a stack of middlewares 
that it's called middleware stack, where every every web request coming to your survey application will flow will flow through this stack of functions that can either ignore the request if they are not interested in it, or they can process it in a certain way. Maybe if there could be a middleware that takes a look at some authorization header, and if it and if it's there, it will maybe read some data from somewhere, or if the authorization is header is missing, it may actually bypass the rest of the stack and respond immediately with 401 authorization error, right? Um, so you can keep stacking these middlewares that will be handling this any incoming web request. And also these middlewares can then modify any outgoing HTTP response, right? So we build a stack of middlewares that web requests flow through, very simply put. Um, and we add these um, middlewares using app.use here, right? So we're, we're adding one middleware that will basically look for any requests that could be requests for static files, right? And it will try and find the corresponding files in our public subfolder. And if it finds one, it will bypass the rest of the stack and respond immediately with the content of the file. So if let's say we get a request to let's say localhost slash index HTML. This middleware will look for a file called index HTML inside our public subfolder. And if it's there, it will skip everything else in the, in the stack of middlewares and it will respond immediately with the content of the index HTML file. Next, we use a JSON middleware that will actually take a look at the content type of the incoming request. And if it's application slash JSON, it will actually parse the JSON into a body property of the request. So then later on, you don't need to parse the JSON anymore. You'll just type request.body and that will be the parsed object from the JSON file. And then we're gonna be including our custom routers as middlewares, right? So for any requests to our server that will start with slash API slash forge slash OAuth, let's say, we're gonna include a router that will handle all the requests starting with this string, right? And similarly for anything starting with, with slash API forge OSS, we're gonna have <clears throat> another router that will handle requests for these, um, for these endpoints. And similar, and finally for model derivative as well, right? So we're, we're basically gonna create three groups of endpoints in our server that, <clears throat> that the client side JavaScript can call to do things like generate a token to authenticate, to upload a file, get a list of uploaded object uh, files, translate a file, things like that, right? And finally, we use this generic middleware here, which is basically gonna be at the very bottom of the stack. And that, that will be used as a fallback mechanism if no other middleware in the stack is able to respond. That probably means that that request is unrecognized or, or, or broken in a certain way, right? So <clears throat> what is a good practice here as well when developing a Node.js server app using Express is adding this use at the bottom, like to basically catch all, right? Anything else that wasn't processed properly and respond with something. So what we do here is if, if the request gets all the way down in the stack, we're just gonna log an error to the console and respond with status code, let's say 400, say, okay, there has been a problem. Maybe the request, the endpoint you used is not recognized. And finally, we call app.listen to actually start our server application, listening on a specific port. So here you can see, this is the way of retrieving the environment variables from the running environment in Node.js that's through process.app. So process is a built-in variable or built-in object in every Node.js process. And by process.nf is basically a dictionary of all the environment variables. So what we do here is we check if there is any environment variable that is called port. And if it is, we save it to our constant or we default to 3000, 3, right? And that's gonna be the number, the port that our app will be listening on. All right. Now, of course, this still isn't ready because we need to provide the, um, the config.js and file and all the express routers for these three groups of endpoints. 
So I'm going to create a new config.js file, again, at the same level where our start.js and package.json file are located. And I'm going to, once again, copy and paste the content for the JS file and paste it in. And it should, it should be very you know, simple to, to crop. Basically, we're, we're just creating a new JavaScript object with two properties, credentials and scopes. And credentials is another object with three properties called client ID, client secret, callback URL. And this is where we're actually trying to retrieve the the Forge app credentials, right? The client ID and client secret from the environment, right? So again, typing process.env dot something, we're looking for some value that was passed to this pro to this Node.js process uh, by the environment. We're looking for Forge client ID, Forge client secret, right? Remember, these are the names we used when we configured, when we created our launch configuration, right? These have to match. Right? If you decide to use different name here, that's totally fine, you can, but then make sure that in your config.js file, you're reading, you're looking for this, for the environment variable with the same name. Otherwise, of course, one of these will end up, the client ID or client secret will end up as undefined and your app will basically complain and stop. And once again, callback URL, you can leave it in your code, but it's not really necessary for today because we're not going to be using any login workflows. We're going to be building an application that allows us to upload, translate, and view our files without any login whatsoever. All right. And scopes, this is something we will get to in a, in a moment. This is basically a part of the authentication process in Forge because in Forge, when you want to communicate, when you want to access different services, you will first of all need to create something called an access token, right? So we use token-based authentication. The way it works is you take your Forge client ID, Forge client secret, send them to Forge and say, please generate a token for me that will be able to do something that will have some amount of um, uh, privileges, right? And these privileges are defined by scope. So if you if you create a new token with, let's say, a scope called bucket create, that access token that Forge will send you back will be able to, you will be able to use it to create new buckets. But for example, you won't be able to use it to upload files, right? For that, you would need another um, scope, which is data create. Or you, if you want to be able to modify existing files in Forge, you would need data write scope. Um, the reason we use these scopes is it's a basically an additional level of security, right? Because um, of course you will want to protect the access token and make sure that nobody can steal it, right? That's also uh, another way to protect that is access tokens always have a limited time to live they will always expire after some amount of time, right? So even if somebody steals them, um, they would only be able to use it for a limited amount of time. And then this extra la uh, layer of security is, if you, for, if you definitely have to send the access token somewhere where it, it could potentially be stolen, let's say to your client side JavaScript, right? Like to Forge Viewer so that uh, Forge Viewer will need some access token to start reading and opening your designs from Forge. But then what, what is a good practice, what we definitely recommend is generating a separate token with a single scope, with single privilege it can do, and that is called viewables read. So when you generate a token, you send it to the client, right? And Forge Viewer will use it to access your designs. That token can only do that. It can only read designs in Forge that have already been processed by, by the Forge model for the service. It will not allow you to do anything, any, anything else. You will not be able to create new files, delete files, delete buckets, right? So even if you know in some bad case, somebody somehow got hold of that access token that you're using in Forge Viewer, first of all, they will only be able to use it for a limited amount of time. And second, the only thing they'll be able to do is just try and access some, some document in Forge, right? But for that, they would even need to know the, the unique ID of those files, which is not very likely either. So again, it's a, like a two extra layers of security and protection. That's what the scopes are for. All right, we've got our config.js file ready. And um, what's left are the routers. 
So let's move on to the next step, the authenticate. Uh, and we're going to use, again, Node.js. OK, <clears throat> so now um, we're going to create a file under the routes folder called OAuth.js with this content. So let me go to our routes folder, create new file, OAuth. It's not auth.js, but oauth.js. This is because oauth is this very popular standard for, for authentication. Um, and that's what we're using in Forge as well. Uh, so here you can see that we're finally getting to this concept of routers in Express, right? We're, we're gonna uh, create a new instance of this Express router. And we're gonna say everything that will, that will come to our router that ends with slash token will be handled with some code, right? But of course, this is, this is not the complete endpoint that this logic will be answering to, right? Because if you go back to start.js, you'll notice that this OAuth express router is attached to an endpoint that actually starts with slash API slash forge slash OAuth. So what that means is that this code will be triggered whenever somebody calls this endpoint, right? Slash API slash forge slash OAuth. That's the original string that this router is attached to. And then if it's followed by a slash token, that, that's when we're gonna run this code, right? So this is a nice way of having like a modular code where you implement a piece of express router and you just attach it to some uh, endpoint uh, prefix string. And then later on, you can take this module without any changes and simply attach it to a different, uh, to, to different set of um, endpoints, right? Uh, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, okay, if somebody makes a, re a get request to this URL, we're gonna generate or retrieve a public token. This is a method that we're gonna implement in a second. This will create a new access token with just this um, viewable to read scope, right? So this is the token we're gonna be using to <clears throat> for our Forge viewer to be able to load models from Forge. Um, so that, that's why to protect our application, it will have very limited privileges. It will only be able to really just read models. And we're gonna send it back to the client in form of a JSON, where we're gonna include the access token and some indication about when it's going to expire. That's it, right? That's our router. Uh, but of course, we still have this one piece missing, uh, get public token. So let's go back. And we're going to implement this functionality. This is already sort of like more getting to the Forge sites where we finally start using the Forge SDKs to communicate with the Autodesk Forge platform. So we're going to create another file. This is going to be, it's, it's got the same name. so. Uh, the naming might, might be a bit confusing, but just know that the OAuth file that we have just created in the routes folder is our express router, right? But then we're going to create another file with the same name in a route slash common subfolder. And this is where we're going to keep our logic for, again, communicating with Forge. So I'm going to go back to my routes folder. I'm going to create another subfolder there it's called common. And under the common folder, I'm going to create a file with the same name, OAuth.js. I think we probably need to change that in the future because that might be a bit confusing. I'm going to paste the, the code from the Learn, Learn Forge website. So what we're doing here, you can see we're importing a one specific class from the Forge SDK, right, right from the the client SDK for Node.js, the module we installed using NPM. And we're using it, we're basically creating a new instance of this auth client two legged. This is, this is the class we're gonna use for generating the tokens without any user login, right? That would be something called a three legged authentication. And that is something we're gonna be looking at in the next topic um, on day two. And we provide a couple of helper functions like get public token, which basically means generate or get a cached token with the public scopes, right? The scopes we've configured in our config object. So only with the viewables read. And it'll also provide a, 
uh, a function, helper function called get internal token, right? So we're gonna use this one to generate tokens that will only be used on the server side, not shared with a client. And these internal tokens will have more privileges, right? In this case, we're gonna use config scopes internal. So in this case, the token that we'll create will be able to create new buckets, read them, read data, create data, update data. All right, and that is it. We're exporting these three helper functions and here we're basically using them in our first express router in the route slash awas.js file. And that's it, that's our first, uh, the first part of our app. Now this, if we tried running this app without anything, it would, um, it would most likely fail because these two routers are not yet implemented, right? We haven't added anything, any OSS JS file or model derivative JS file in the routes folder. So what I'm gonna do for now, just to do run a quick check, I'm gonna comment these out. And just to try it out, I'm gonna to go to our route slash OAuth file where we implemented our first express router. And I'm gonna put a breakpoint in here. And let's see, let's try and run our app. We run it, you see, okay, so now this is the log from our start.js file, right? So the app is now listening on port 3000. And what that means is that I can go to localhost 3000 on my machine, right? And I'm, I'll start communicating with my server. Of course, if I just do simply this, right? This request will go through the stack of middlewares, but it will not be answered by anything, right? Because no, none of the middlewares will be able to find some reasonable answer for it. So if I, if I do this, I'm just going to get an error saying cannot get slash. So the server doesn't know how to respond to an endpoint that is just localhost 3000. But what I can do is I can try typing in the API slash forge slash OAuth slash token. So if you remember, this is the part of the URL that we used when attaching a router using the app.use and slash token is going to be recognized, should be recognized by that one, um, one method we added to the, to the express router, right? So now if I make this request, perfect. See now, our breakpoint in VS Code was hit. So now <clears throat> our app is suspended and we can start stepping through the code. So see now we can take a look at the request, the, the REQ property, right? This is basically, <clears throat> this contains all the information about the incoming request. So we see that, you know, it's coming from the base URL API Forge OAuth, that there's maybe gonna be some parameters or in this case, there is no payload, right? We haven't uploaded any information with this request. We're basically just asking for something in a response. So now we can try and, you know, stepping through the code, so use the F11 or step into. See, now we are, we are in our helper code. We're calling get token for the public scopes, which are, again, just a single token scope and that is viewables read. We're gonna return back. Now we're back to in our express router. <clears throat> and you'll see that, okay, here's our token, right? So this was returned to us by Ford. So we, we sent our client ID and client secrets to Forge, to the authentication service. And we asked it to generate a new token for us that has a single privilege and that is viewing models. And it generated this weird long string for us. That is the access token that we can now use in communication with Forge for limited amount of time, because here you can see it expires in property set to uh, 3600 um, seconds. So that is one hour. So this token will only be valid for one hour. All right, and now we're gonna send it back to the client who made the request as a JSON. Boom, and if we go back to website, you can see this is our JSON response, right? So later on in the final session today, uh, we're gonna use this JSON to take the access token and give it to Forge Viewer so that Forge Viewer can actually 
start loading our models. And that's it. That was the final step for our session, session two today. Let me stop the app and go back to our presentation. All right, that's us. So now, once again, it is your turn. Um, so please try and follow these steps. Again, what you want to do is use ter terminal or command prompt um, to create a new project. So just create a new folder. Uh, go into that folder and type uh, in terminal or command prompt, just type npm init or npm init y um, to basically create a default package JSON. Install the dependent, the three dependencies um, that we that we use. That's the Express, Malter, and um, Forge APIs. So you can do that by again typing in npm install and then Express, Malter, Forge dash APIs dash dash safe. The dash dash safe flag is important to make sure that the dependencies and their versions are captured in your manifest file in the package JSON. And then uh, if you're using VS Code, create a launch configuration, right? That will automatically create this launch the JSON file in a .VS Code subfolder. Um, and then in the root of that folder, uh, create a config.js where we try and pick some of the inputs from environment variables. Um, then create a start.js file, which is gonna be the starting point for our server, Express.js server. Um, and then implement the um, Express router for uh, authentication for the endpoint that actually create that generates the access token that will later be used by Forge Viewer. And again, if you missed any of the steps, um, you can always refer back to uh, the view your models tutorial here. And these are basically the two steps we just covered, right? Creating a server in Node.js and adding the authentication server-side logic for Node.js as well. And then, then again, if you wanna be able to run your application in its current state, just make sure to comment out the other two routers which haven't been implemented yet. All right. So let's see if there are any questions uh, right now. Uh, the, uh, all right, there's a comment. I have a warning regarding the naming of the file. Is this going to be a problem? Um, not sure which file you have in mind. Is it one of the uh, one of the files in in the source code, like the start JS or um, config JS? The file that includes all of these files. Oh, the uh, start.js. Probably, I'm thinking. So let me go back to the source code. For example. All right, so the naming is pretty important here. So make sure make sure that um, yours is consistent with what you see here, because again, um, and it goes for uh, case sensitivity sensitivity as well. Because when you look at, for example, start JS, right? You could name this file any way you want. Sometimes I call mine, instead of start.js, I, I name it server.js. But then of course, if you go back to your launch configuration for VS Code, this would no longer apply, right? So if you decide to set your um, starting a JavaScript file to a different name, make sure that your launch configuration <clears throat> reflects that as well, right? So here it, it is start.js. Also, be careful about slashes, right? So in my case, I'm on Mac. 
Um, so I'm using forward slashes, but if you're on Windows, um, when, when, the, um, when VS Code generates the launch configuration for you, it's very likely that yours is gonna look like so, All right? So it's most likely gonna have two backslashes. Um, it's not a single backslash because that is used for special escape sequences. So this would actually try and figure, turn this slash S into a escape sequence. So if you actually want to include a proper backslash, you need to double it, right? So this is what it, most likely what it would look like on Windows. I'm gonna keep it to forward slash because again, I'm on um, Mac OS. And the same, um, well, actually that's an interesting question. I think this would work the same for Windows as well this type of uh, referencing. So Node.js is probably fixing these slashes for you automatically. So I, I don't think you need to change these. These should remain in your Node.js code. You should keep using forward slashes like I do here, um, even if you're on Windows. Okay. Um, so that's for the naming and same for, you see here, um, in these cases, um, I, I could as well write you know, dot slash route slash auth dot JS, um, right? Because we are actually referring to this file here, auth JS. But um, you can actually leave the extension if you if you don't. Well, I mean, we can leave it in to make it really explicit that this is what we're trying to reference. Um, but it's not required the extension, right? Um, and similarly in our router, here you can see that we are referencing. Another, mod, another JavaScript file using a relative path. So we're starting in our folder and we're looking for something inside a common subfolder. And we're looking for a file called OAuth.js. That's this one. All right, so again, if you decide to change the name of one of these JavaScript files, you definitely can, but then don't forget to update the references. So if I decided to change this to I don't know, common.js, I would need to go back to my router and update this path to slash common slash common.js. All right. And again, just to repeat that, clarify, make sure if you, you know, if you run into any weird problems where Node.js will start complaining that it cannot find a file, make sure that you actually have your folder that you've actually opened the folder where your package JSON file is located, right? Again, sometimes people accidentally open the parent folder of that, right? Which is different. Um, let me show that here. I'm gonna op open a new window of VS Code. And I'm gonna open a folder and I'm here on purpose, I'm gonna open a wrong folder here, right? So now you'll see that we're now actually, our project is this day one folder and that, that, that's, a, that's a wrong one, right? There is no, there is no um, package.json file here that is actually included in a subfolder, which is wrong, right? We need to open exactly the folder where the package JSON was created when we ran npm init. <clears throat> Right, so here, if I try running the app, I will probably get errors like, well, I cannot find any star.js file, right? Because there is no star.js file here. That, is, that, that file is in a subfolder. So make sure that you got the right folder open. It should look like this. See, this is our main folder that we open and it includes the package JSON or star.js, config.js and public and routes. Subfolders. All right, that's it. So unless there are no other questions, you now have about an hour until we meet again and move on to session number three. So I'll talk to you then. <clears throat> All right. Thank you everyone, welcome back to step three, session three of our tutorial today. As part of um, 
this session, we will start adding more logic to our Node.js server application. Um, sp specifically, we're going to add more logic to be able to um, consume, to accept files uploaded to us from, from a browser by our users. And second, we will add um, logic that will be used to actually trigger um, the processing, the translation of our uploaded designs so that they can be previewed by Forge Viewer. Again, before we move on to the live demo, um, <clears throat> let's wait for a little bit to see if, um, if, there's, if there are any questions or if people are able to um, get their apps running. So has everyone been able to um, implement the authentication endpoint and try running it, try actually accessing the endpoint from the browser um, and retrieve the access token? If you could raise your hands, uh, if you've been able to get that far. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, so we're good. That's, that's perfect. Um, all right, in that case, we can move on to um, our third step today. Um, so again, we're just gonna add one more router, just like the one we added for the authentication endpoints. We're gonna add one more express router that's gonna be used to handle, again, the requests that have something to do with <clears throat> file upload and data listing. Um, so there's gonna be an endpoint for creating a new bucket. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a bucket in the Forge terminology is something like a folder, like a top level folder that you can use to organize files when uploading them to uh, the data management service. It, you cannot have nested folders. It's really bucket is like a super simple folder that's just at the top level and it can contain objects and nothing else. Um, if you wanted to have a more specific um, <clears throat> folder structure and some additional features like versioning or custom owners, let's say. Um, for that, um, you would need to, um, that would be an additional logic that you would want to implement in your own application. We will add also um, one endpoint, like I, like I mentioned earlier, for that will allow our server app to accept files uploaded from the browser. That's where we're going to be using the Malter third-party dependency, the NPM module that we installed earlier. And finally, we're going to add some endpoints for <clears throat> listing the buckets, um, those top level folders, right? And the objects uploaded in there. This is something we're going to use on the client side so that, you know, in the sidebar, we can actually list the data, the files that are available for viewing to the visitor of our web, app, web application. And finally, and another express router, that one's going to be used to trigger the translation, the post-processing of <clears throat> the uploaded design using the Forge model derivative service. And for those of you who may be like very new to Forge, when I keep talking about this conversion and processing and the model derivative service, um, the purpose of that component of the Autodesk Forge platform is to basically take your design files and it can today in just over 60 different file formats, not just Autodesk formats like Revit files, Inventor, um, <clears throat> AutoCAD files, but also um, SolidWorks, Creo, Bentley, uh, our competitors file formats. The Forge and the Forge model derivative service can consume all of these um, uh, design uh, file formats and it, it'll extract all sorts of information that you may later need for to build your custom experiences, custom applications. So it's extracting things like 2D drawings, if there are any for your, let's say Revit or um, Inventor, um, Inventor models, um, 3D models, of course, <clears throat> um, thumbnails, um, scene hierarchies, or if you know if your design is using a specific a, a tree structure, let's say in Revit, Revit families and Revit family instances. And what's really important is the model derivative service is also extracting all the metadata <clears throat> available to on individual elements of your design, right? That metadata then can then be viewed 
in Fortinet Viewer as well. But what's more important, this metadata can then be used to, you know, customize the visualization to really add your value. Where you know you can use some property information found on individual objects in your 3D model to maybe query some completely you know foreign data source for some additional information and link it in, right? And maybe represent this external data source and the external information in terms of maybe some color coded heat maps in your in your forge viewer right because the viewer can be heavily customized and we, as we will show um, this week on Thursday in the, <clears throat> the viewer extension um, topic um, so the model derivative service is responsible for extracting all this information right it does not process your uploaded files automatically we leave that to your application to decide when is the time to start extracting the you know the 2d drawings and 3d models and metadata from the designs right um, for example in bim 360 the product that that's been built with forge uh, bim 360 starts extracting this information from your designs as soon as you upload them but fusion team or a360 and other two products built on top of forge those um, postpone the extraction until you actually need, need it, right? So um, in Fusion Team or A360, when you upload a design, Forge does not care about it just yet. Only at the moment when you actually try and open that design, um, um, the A360 application will send a request to the Forge model derivative service asking it to start extracting the information. <clears throat> and so similarly, this is what we're going to do here in our um, basic application today. We will make sure that um, the, the, the model derivative service starts extracting the information only when, when we tell it to. And we're going to make that a part of the user interface of our app today. All right, demo time. <clears throat> So let's move to the third part of our view your models tutorial on the learn forge website <clears throat> and for node.js once again we're going to add again another express router that will handle um, all the data related um, endpoints and um, requests so let me copy this code to the clipboard now let's create a new file called oss.js in our routes folder. There's our routes folder. And create a new file called oss.js. By the way, oss stands for <clears throat> object simple storage. That's part of the Forge data management service. So it's like a very simple um, storage of files with some object name uh, inside the bucket. All right, now let's take a quick look at what um, what this code is doing. Um, so once again, you may see here, this is again, we're going back to the express middleware concept, right? Um, we are not attaching any specific um, code for and to any specific get or post or delete request to any URL. We're just calling, we're just saying a router.use and we're passing in a function. This is again, a <clears throat> and just a simple function that will be inserted on the stack of all the middleware that every request handled by this router will go through, right? Um, and you'll sure you, you'll see you'll see why and how how powerful this concept of middleware is. Um, let's see what's happening here inside, right? So any request that will be handled by this OSS Express router will go through this function where we will first retrieve the internal token. And once again, internal token is something we're going to generate with uh, like an access token with more privileges for our internal use on the server side, right? That's going to be the access token that was created <clears throat> with scopes to create buckets, read buckets, upload files, delete files, modify files. <clears throat> so that, that token is going to be more powerful. We're definitely not going to share it with the client. This token will only be used um, for our service side processing. And what we do, you can see that we're basically just storing the token as a custom property on our web request. That's the request object that is flowing through the stack of middleware, right? So what we do, we just enhance the request object 
going through the stack and we let it go for, you know, we pass it forward. That's, that's done by calling this next function, which is a third per parameter to the function we're defining here as the middleware. So all we do here is we just say for any request that comes in, um, we retrieve a token, store it as some custom property on this request object, and we pass it forward. That's it, right? And it's really helpful when you think about it because then in any other request handler, like here, the router.get, this is where we're adding some function that will handle get requests to this URL, right? Again, remember that we're actually mounting this router to um, all endpoints starting with API Forge OSS. So here, when we say slash buckets, we actually mean that this code will run for the get requests to this complete URL. For all of these requests, we would need to always request the same internal token, right? Because all of these will require the token to either create a bucket, list buckets, create upload files, things like that. Here, we can simplify that very nicely by adding this simple piece of middleware at the top of the stack to make sure that any request that comes in will automatically have the you know token stored in this reg dot OAuth underscore token property, right? You'll see that this is then being used in you know in different places in different endpoint handlers. So whether it's a post request to API Forge OSS objects, or whether it's a post request to buckets, or whether it's you know a get request to buckets we can always expect this OAuth token um, property to be available on the web request option. All right, that is our data management uh, middleware. And now for the actual endpoints, the get buckets, this is a URL that we're gonna be using on, on the client side when we actually move to the final fourth step when we start implementing the, you know, the HTML and the client side JavaScript. This is the endpoint that we're gonna use to populate the tree view in the sidebar, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna first call this API Forge OSS buckets URL without any parameters. And that will here, that will hit this um, branch of this uh, if else condition. So what it's gonna do is we're gonna use once again, a class from our Forge SDK, right? For buckets and we're going to say get buckets which is basically we're going to be asking for the list of all the or, or the, the first 100 buckets that were created on, and are owned by <clears throat> this specific forge application and we will return the buckets in a json to the client right and that information in the client will be used to create a tree and then when we click on a specific bucket on the client side on the HTML page, we will make another request to this API Forge OSS buckets URL, but this time passing in a parameter um, that's going to represent the actual bucket name, right? So here, this is you can see how in Express how you retrieve, let's say, query per parameters that you add to the URL, typically after the you know question mark. If you type uh, request.query.something, in this case, ID, you're basically asking if that web request included some query parameter after a question mark. And if it did, it's gonna be available under that name, right? So we check if there was an ID query parameter passed into this get request. And if it was, we hit the second branch of our if condition. <clears throat> and here, instead of listing buckets, we will be listing objects inside a specific bucket. And again, we limit it by you know, the first 100. So keep that in mind if you, know, if you expect like, large numbers of objects in your buckets, you would want to either increase this number or what's a recommended you know, good practice to start paging, paging through, right? So you can make a request for the first 100 and then check if there's more. And if there is to make another request to you know, keep downloading additional pages of the data if, uh, if there are more, if there's more. That's for uh, the get API Forge OSS buckets request. Then there is a post request, right? This means post is typically used for web requests that are not reading information, but creating some new kind of resource or uploading a new resource. Um, in this case, 
when somebody makes a post request to the same URL as above, right? But again, earlier we were looking at the get request. You see, we added this code by uh, via router.get. And now we're calling router.post with the same URL. So this logic will be called only when the client makes a post request, post web request. Um, in this case, we will expect some kind of body payload to be included with the request. And we expect it to be a JSON uh, looking like this with a single property called bucket key um, that contains the name of the bucket that we want to create. So as you as you probably understand now, <clears throat> this, this endpoint is going to be used for creating new buckets from the client. So when the client makes a post request to this URL, we will on the server side use this protected internal token that can that has more privileges, right? We will create the bucket uh, based on that request, as opposed to us sharing this powerful access token with the client, which is again something we do not want to do. All right. Um, and here, this is a, a little trick that you know I, I was mentioning earlier that since the bucket names must be globally unique, in this case, what we do to make sure that you know, well, not to make sure, but to improve the chance that the name of your bucket will actually be unique. What we're doing is we're taking the bucket key that was passed to us by the client in the in the body of the request, right? That's the request that body that bucket key. Uh, so we're taking the, the bucket key that was actually specified by the user and we're prefixing it with client ID, right? So we're taking the client ID that was configured for this uh, Forge application. We're setting it all to lowercase because again, as I mentioned earlier, the bucket name must only consist of lowercase characters, numbers, dashes, underscores, and dots. And we're prefixing it with the client ID and dash, right? So by that, we're making it more probable that whatever name of bucket your users will type in in that HTML interface, that is going to be unique because before actually creating the bucket, we will prefix the name with the client ID of our Forge application. You don't have to do that, but again, we do it here to again avoid problems with um, name clashes. <clears throat> And for policy key, this is also something we briefly touched upon in the previous session. Um, when creating a bucket, you, you'll want to specify a data retention policy. There's three options. There's uh, temporary, um, transient, or permanent. Uh, transient, as you can see here, means that any data uploaded to that bucket will be automatically removed in 24 hours. Um, temporary means that the data will be removed in uh, 30 days and um, persistent or yeah, permanent or persistent means that data will remain in the bucket forever or until you remove it manually. And in this case, since this is just a demo, when we're creating our new bucket, we will always hard code the data retention policy to be transient, meaning that any data uploaded to the bucket will be removed within, 20, uh, well, after 24 hours. And we create our bucket, again, using the Forge SDKs. Um, and finally, our post request to a different endpoint. So earlier we were writing a logic for post requests to slash API slash forge OSS buckets. Now we're writing logic for <clears throat> a post request to a URL slash API slash forge slash OSS objects, right? So this means when we're gonna, when we retrieve a post request to this URL, we expect that somebody is sending us a file that they want to upload to our to our server application. And here you can already see finally this special little thing, right? Typically when you write the router.get or router.post, you include the, the string representing the final part of the URL, right? Where the, the router was mounted, mounted to. And then some function that is executed for each request to that URL. But here, there's actually something special. You can see that after the, the, the part of the final part of the URL, there is this multer thing. And only then as a third parameter, we're finally adding um, our function that will actually do something right with this web request. And what this means, this multer, uh, this is once again, what we import from the third party NPM module that we installed, right? Multer. 
Um, what this will do is um, this will insert another little function middleware once again <clears throat> that will handle all the incoming requests in certain way, right? And what Mulder is doing, by the way, we're configuring it here by this dot notation, right? So we're uh, creating new Mulder object and then calling dot single on it. Um, what this will do is it will process every incoming request handled by uh, every incoming post request to this URL, right? It will look for files that are being uploaded in that request. And if there are any, it will save them temporarily in some local folder. In our case, there's gonna be an uploads folder in the roots of our project. So it will cache all the uploaded files in here, and then it will provide in the request, it, it will add a new property to the request called file. That's gonna include information about this file that was uploaded to, to, to our server by, by the browser, right? So then we can work with that as, as needed. So what you can see here is we process every single incoming request to this URL um, by our third-party utility here. And then we can immediately start calling reg.file, right? Because this file property will be added to each request by this middleware. So we can say, for example, reg.file.path to get the local file path to the, to the file that was stored in that uploads folder. That's gonna be, that folder will be automatically created in the root of our project folder. Um, and we can, or we can use reg.file.original name, which is gonna be the name of that file that was originally uploaded to us, right? Because the information that web request coming to our server app from the browser will include the actual content of the file as well as its name. And what we're gonna do here, again, we're gonna use the <clears throat> official Forge SDKs for Node.js to upload an, a new object to a specific bucket with a specific name and with the specific file content. So that's it, right? So one request for listing buckets and their objects, another request for creating new buckets, and finally a request for uploading files so that when somebody uploads a file to our server application, the server application will take that same file and upload it to Forge with the same um, original file name. That is for um, the OSS, the object simple storage. And next, uh, the translation of our file. And when we look at the Node.js version um, on the LearnForge website, uh, we're going to create this model to relative JS file under our roots. Again, it's going to be another express router. Um, also using this middleware at the top to always prepare the internal token for any other request handlers. Let me copy to clipboard. Go to our code again and create a new file under our routes folder called model derivative js. All right. And again, we can take a quick look at what's happening here. So this is going to be the middleware function that will process every incoming web request handled by this router. And it will always attach the token and some client information to every request. And then here, you can see we're defining just a single um, handler for a post request. In this case, post request to URL, um, API Forge model derivative jobs, right? So this is gonna be where our server is gonna expect requests to actually start translation of a specific file. The, the name of the file or the unique ID of the file that we wanna process, we expect to receive in the body of the request and we expect it to be, be um, stored under a property called object name. So again, we expect that this request is going to be a, uh, is, is going to include a JSON payload with just a single property called object name, which is going to be the unique ID of the of the uploaded file that we want to start processing. And what we're doing here, we're basically specifying some inputs to our translate method. So we say that the input 
of our job is going to be this unique ID of one of our objects. And the output, we're going to say that, okay, the output, we want to generate an SVF. This is a um, proprietary uh, file format used by Forge that is basically used for efficient viewing of 2D and 3D content on the web using Forge Viewer. Um, when you go to the documentation for the Forge model derivative service, you will see that all those, you know, over 60 different file formats can be converted into an SVF. And some of them, some of the files can also be converted into other formats. But SVF is the really is really the dominant output format that we typically translate everything to so that we can later view all the SVFs, um, SVF outputs in Forge Viewer. And we also specify that we want to extract both 2D drawings as well as 3D views, right? Sometimes if you only need to extract 3D views, you could change this array to only include the 3D. And that's it. And then we make a call to this uh, Forge SDK class, the derivatives API, and we call it translate, right? So this is where we pass the information about what we want to translate. And again, here, we also need to, of course, include uh, the, the access token that gives us the right to actually call this, to trigger this operation in the Autodesk Forge platform. And that is it. Now, one final thing we must not forget is earlier we commented out the two routers, right? Adding them to the proper endpoint prefix. So let me uncomment these two lines and we can maybe just for clarity, just append OSS.js and monitor.js. The extensions are not required, but again, to make it uh, clear, hopefully, that what we're doing here is we're importing a mod, uh, an express router from this file. And here we're importing an express router from the model derivative JS file. And we are attaching them, or they use the term mount. So we're mounting them to these URL prefixes. So any endpoint. Any requests coming to slash API slash forward slash OSS will be handled by the code in this router. And similarly, any requests coming to slash API slash forward slash model derivative slash anything will be handled by this express router. All right, and that's it. Now let's try our app one more time. Let me launch it, launch it here. And let me just quickly copy and paste this URL and go to our browser. All right, one more time. If I try, if I simply try and access this server, the the index page, not going to see anything, right? Because we still haven't provided any content or any response to a request to our server that goes to just slash nothing, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to append this slash API slash forward slash OSS, right? This is the prefix that's that's going to be handled where everything underneath or everything following this string will be handled by our OSS router. If we go back to our OSS JavaScript file, we'll see that here we can try and make a GET request to API Forge OSS buckets. So API slash forward slash OSS slash buckets. What we do here is we can maybe try and put a breakpoint inside our handler. When we make this get request. Boom. See? So now we will try and see if anyone added any ID parameter to our query. And we see that, no, there is none. Right? In that case, we will hit the first branch of our if condition. And we're just going to list all buckets. And that's probably going to be empty. Oh no, there is actually one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we I created a testing bucket earlier, right? So uh, what we get in response from Forge is an array of a single item with bucket key, uh, Petter Browse Forge training bucket, right? And the policy key is persistent. That's the data retention policy, uh, right? So we will return this array to the client as a JSON. See, so we've manipulated the array to only include like, ID and text and type, right? There's like some basic properties for um, that we will later use for the 
uh, tree view in the sidebar, and that's it. Now what we can try is we can take the ID of my bucket and pass it on as an ID query parameter, right? So I'm gonna say question mark ID equals third browse for training bucket. This is what's called the query parameters. Anything you append after the question mark in the URL. If we try this URL again, we're back. We hit this end break uh, breakpoint again. But now if we check the ID, you can see that it was able to parse that additional parameter that I used in the URL. So in this case, it should actually hit the second branch of our if condition. And now instead of listing buckets, it will try and list all objects in this one bucket. Now there's probably not going to be anything, right? So the length is zero for now. So it'll, it should return an empty array as a JSON. And that is correct. All right. So I believe that is all for session number three. So let's make some time for questions. I see there are some. <clears throat> all right, so there's a question in the Q&A. Um, so basically in the get token function, if the token gets expired, the function get token will generate the new one. And if it hasn't, uh, expired, the function will return it from cache. Exactly, Vinit, perfect. Yes, um, this is also a good practice, right? Because you don't want to keep spamming any you know, Forge or any really cloud um, service with requests for token every single time you want to do some operation, right? The access tokens have some, again, um, time to live, like the expiration time so that you can keep reusing them, right? And not spamming the server with requests for a new token every single time. And you got it exactly right, Vinny. When we take a look at the uh, common OAuth JS file at the get token, this is exactly what we're doing here, right? This get token function, helper function is called whenever we call get public token or get internal token anywhere in our server side code. And what it does is it takes the list of scopes that we want to get the token for, right? So that could be, again, if it's if we're generating the public token, it's just a single scope called viewables read. But if we're generating an internal token, that's the one that contains the bucket create, bucket read, data create, data read, data write scopes, right? That's the more powerful token that we only want to use on the server side. We just pass this list of strings to our helper get token method function. We just connect all these, um, all these scopes with a plus sign. That's just our internal, you know, it's just an idea of how to handle that here to create a cache key. And then we use this map object, global object as a cache. And we check, oh, does this cache include a token for these scopes already, right? And if it does, we retrieve it and we check, and is the expiration time for that cached token later than now? I mean, in other words, this, this will be true if the token has not expired yet, right? And if that is true, we will return the cached access token. Otherwise, right, if maybe the token was requested for different scopes, or if maybe um, there is a cache token for this list of scopes, but um, it has already expired, this return does not happen, right? And what we do is we call this client.authenticate, which is basically us saying, okay, Forge, we need a new fresh version of access token with these scopes, right? When we receive it, we save it in the cache under that cache key and we return it. So yes, this is a little helper that basically makes sure that we always reuse access tokens while they're still valid instead of you know, generating new token every single time we need to do something with Forge. All right, that was a good question. And I see there's a comment maybe in the chat. All right, so this is a divergent question. 
four pounds a free change. Do, 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 do. Zero two. Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, one of our attendees has also uh, noticed that um, there is now a new format, uh, a successor to the SVF format that I mentioned earlier uh, called SVF2. Um, you can learn more about it if you're interested. Um, you can simply um, Google for Autodesk Forge blog SVF2. And you'll see it here. Um, so by default, we typically use SVF. This is the standard, again, format we use for viewing your designs, whether they're 2D drawings or 3D models in for Viewer. Um, and by the way, SVF stands for a streamable viewing format, right? So that's a special type of format where all the 3D geometry and textures and all this you know, data relevant to your 3D view or 2D drawing is split into different files and stored in a way that allows you to progressively download the content to the viewer and you know, load it over time, but still allowing you to get the main features and the main geometry really early, right? So it's a progressive loading format that allows you to uh, very quickly get the basic 3D shape of your model and then that loads, even if you have like a, a slow, you know, internet connection, the remaining features are being loaded over time and added to the viewer over time. So that's what, that's why it's called SVF, the streamable viewing format. Um, now, however, there's been um, some demand for improving the, um, the performance and size um, behavior, like, um, properties of the format because there were some issues where, for example, if you had a Revit model or a Navisworks model with a, with lots of instance geometries, um, the, the file size of the SVF could go really, could get really large, making it, of course, then uh, more difficult to transfer that entire SVF file and all these assets from Forge servers to the viewer to load it up, right? That's why our team started working on a successor format called SVF2, which is much more optimized. Uh, it takes more, more time to process, but it's, it, it includes some exciting technology that allows it to basically detect geometries that look the same, right? So if you think about, I mean, if you think about this kind of model where there's a lot of you know, cylindrical shapes, all of those are basically just cylinders just with a slightly different radius and slightly different lengths and placed in different you know areas around in the around the 3d scene but ultimately they're all just slightly differently transformed instances of a cylinder right and the svf2 format is really powerful in that it can detect all these similarities and replace i mean in svf1 all these all these pipes would be extra and beams would be extracted as separate geometries. But with SVF2, many of these will just be stored as a single geometry, just with different transforms. So it's really powerful that in that you know it decreases the file size significantly, so making the loading time faster, right? For the file to be loaded to the web page and into Forge Viewer so that you can view it. And it also makes the runtime performance much better because um, you know since it detects these instances of the same geometry, um, it helps the render itself know that oh by the way hey all these are just cylinders so you don't need to upload this extra geometry to the graphics card. All of this geometry is just a cylinder in just different shape, uh, different transforms, right? Uh, so it helps with the uh, runtime performance as well. So if you're curious about this type of technology, definitely check out the blog post. And or if you head over to the official Forge documentation to the model derivative service. And I believe it's in the, yes, <clears throat> developer's guide. You'll see some notes for SVF2 uh, beta testers. This will explain um, how you can actually request um, how you can ask the model derivative service to generate an SVF2 instead of SVF, SVF1 for you. And exactly as Vinny uh, was asking, in our code, we could definitely do that as well. If we go back to our 
model derivative JS file with our express router. Here, we could definitely do this, right? But for now, um, let's stick with the original SVF because if you want to translate your file for SVF2, there, there are a few minor changes you then need to do in the client side when you're in initializing a Forge viewer in, on your HTML page. So for now, to make sure that everything works for everyone, we'll stick with SVF as is. <clears throat> All right. So once again, your turn. Um, so let's see, um, again, add these two extra um, express routers to your application, right, under the routes folder. One, the oss.js file, where, we're, where you're going to handle the request for listing buckets or their objects. Then there's the other function that you're going to use to handle requests to create new buckets. And then finally, there's going to be the third function that, that's going to handle um, requests where the users will upload files to you, right? <clears throat> that's for the data management. And then for the model derivative service, you'll just have a single handler for um, a post request to, what was it, a API, <clears throat> API forge model derivative slash jobs. Right, so this is what you're going to use so that when you receive that post request from the client, from the web application, uh, you're going to start a new trend, you know, translation job for a specific object, asking the model delivery service to, to extract it into SVF format and to include both 2D drawings and 3DDs. All right, I'm asking one more question. Uh, in that case, is there still, still a scenario in which it should be more useful to use SVF over SVF2? So, um, no, no. Um, I, I cannot really think of any benefits of, um, of um, using SVF1, but the, the, the one thing we're still using SVF is that um, SVF2 is still in beta. Right, so it's being tested. There are still some things we need to flesh out, right? So we're collecting feedback from customers. So for now, I would say, um, if you want to experiment, if you like living on the edge, definitely try SVF2. Um, if you're building something that you are considering to be almost production ready, right, or stable, um, stay with SVF for now. And I mean, really, uh, the SVF2 makes the most sense in situations where, um, you know, our customers have like these extremely large infrastructure models, right, that are just huge. And in that case is, you know, the SVF can blow up, right, and it can take more time to be downloaded to the viewer. And it, it can, you know, the performance of orbiting the camera around may not be as smooth, but for majority of designs that people process, SVF is more than sufficient, right? SVF1 can already, it per performs really well. Um, so I would say again, yeah, if, you, if you're building something that, that you consider to be you know, stable or almost production ready, and if you, if you don't have crazy large models, stick to SVF. But then the other option, if you like living on the edge, experimenting with new stuff, or if you have like some, if you have some really, really complex data sets, try SVF2. And uh, we've seen some really great um, like size decrease, you know, ratios and, and again, performance, runtime performance improvements as well. All right. And there are no other questions, in which case um, it's your turn and we will meet back here in roughly one hour and 15 minutes to look at the final step in session four. So I'll see you then. See you guys. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our final session of our basic Forge tutorial today. Um, in this final step, we will move, move away from the server side that we've been building. 
will move to the client side. So we're going to we're going to add a basic HTML markup for our index page, and we're going to add a little bit of CSS and a little bit of JavaScript to populate this uh, tree view in the sidebar with our buckets and and objects, and also allow users to create their own buckets and upload files. And then we're going to uh, we're going to initialize, of course, the the one exception in that portfolio of Forge, um, Forge platform components, which is the Forge Viewer, which is a JavaScript library as opposed to all the other components, which are web services. Forge Viewer is a WebGL JavaScript library that can be embedded into any HTML page to load and preview your 2D drawings or 3D models that have been processed by the Forge model derivative service into the SVF format as we discussed. Uh, during the previous session. So let's look at that. All right, again, a bit more time for any, any pending questions. So has everyone been able to get their server side working? Um, we're able to test the endpoints for listing buckets and their contents. I hope that was the case. Um, if not, feel free to um, submit your questions uh, throughout this final session, and me or uh, Deepali will will try and get to your get to your questions as soon as possible. Make sure that you can all successfully complete your first Forge application today. All right. So what we're going to do for the final part? Again, we're going to create a basic HTML markup for our index page. Style it a little bit with a, some basic CSS. And we're going to add a piece of JavaScript functionality that will handle the sidebar. That again is the tree view with some right click context menus for creating buckets and uploading files. And then we're going to add another chunk of JavaScript functionality on the client side that's going to handle the viewer itself. So it's, it's going to handle the instantiation of the viewer itself, as well as the actual loading of files into the viewer when we select them in the sidebar. All right, let's get to that. We're back on our LearnForge website and we can move to the final subtopic in our View Your Models tutorial. Again, we can choose Node.js, but it doesn't really matter here, right? Because this final part of the tutorial is really agnostic to any programming language you've used on the server side. That's really another important part and this beauty of this server development, right? Because when you implement your server side part as a set of APIs, a set of basically URL endpoints that your, your client side can call, um, you decouple that server-side logic from your client quite nicely, right? So then you can start building your, your front end, your client-side code, JavaScript and HTML, um, in a really you know, simple agnostic way. You can communicate with these URLs, with these endpoints that we've defined so far, and you don't really have to worry whether they're implemented using Node.js, .NET, or, or Python, or any other lang server-side language for that matter. All right, what we're going to do now is uh, we need to create some basic files for some basic uh, client side assets, right? That's going to be the index HTML file. And we're, we're going to create a basic CSS file that's going to be used to style that index page and two JavaScript files, like we mentioned earlier, one for managing the tree, one for managing the viewer itself. All right, so let's do that. We're going to start with the index HTML page. Let's see, copy the markup to clipboard. Head over to our code to the public folder. Again, as we mentioned earlier, right? This is um, in our server code. We've used this express built-in middleware that's going to take a look at every incoming request, and it'll try and see if that. URL includes some file name that actually exists in our public folder. And if it does exist there, this middleware will bypass any other middlewares in the stack and it will respond immediately with the content of that file. So now what, what happens is when we go to our public folder, 
And we create a new file there called index.html. I can just paste the content from the Learn Force website for now. What will happen now is when we run the app and we simply go to localhost column 3000, the browser will try and ask for either, first of all, for just the empty, uh, empty URL, right? So it's just gonna be localhost column 3000 slash nothing. Um, and if it doesn't get any answer, it'll try index HTML because index HTML is considered to be the default name of a page when you navigate to some URL, right? And in that case, as soon as the web request hits this middleware, it will try and see, oh, okay, isn't there maybe an index.html file inside the public folder? And it'll find it here. And, and because of that, the server will send that file back to the client, ignoring any other processing of that request by the, uh, this additional logic in the express routers, right? Because those are not needed anymore because that request has already been um, served and responded to. So we've got our index.html file here. Um, Probably don't need to go, I don't think we need to go into too much detail um, here. Uh, we're basically using uh, Bootstrap, which is a CSS framework, very popular one, uh, managed, maintained, built by Twitter. Um, so we're including some of the dependencies of Bootstrap here. Um, so uh, jQuery and Bootstrap JavaScript code itself. And we're also in including a, another dependency for something uh, called JS tree, which is a jQuery plugin for building interactive tree views of some custom data using jQuery. Um, so we're including those, that dependency here as well. A couple of style sheets, again, for bootstrap and for JS tree. And here, this is where we actually start bringing in dependencies for Forge. Right, so if you if you want to use Forge Viewer on your website, you'll need two things. You'll need to bring in a JavaScript with the Forge Viewer library itself, right, so that you can instantiate it on your page, and a style sheet that is used for some basic styling of the toolbar of the viewer and you know the <clears throat> the property dialog and the settings panel and the UI like that. And finally, what we're doing here is we're bringing in dependencies of our own, right? So here, we're gonna try and link in a main.css file from some CSS subfolder, right? So that one doesn't exist yet, but we'll, we're gonna add it soon. And we're also trying to load in two JavaScript files of our own. You can see that as opposed to the previous script and link tags that start with either slash slash or HTTP or HTTPS, here we're using a relative path, right? That means that the complete full URL for these assets, it's gonna be resolved based on the position of this index file itself, right? So if we're in an index HTML, or let's say this page is gonna appear when we go to localhost column 3000, nothing, um, then trying to reference this path or this path is gonna to resolve to localhost 3000 slash CSS slash main CSS or localhost 3000 slash JS slash forge tree that JS, right? So what we need to make sure about is that this slash dot JS slash forge tree JS will be found by that middleware that we're using in our, in our server right here by this, by this middleware. So what we wanna do is create a new folder in, under our public folder called JS and another one called CSS. Oh, sorry, I created a file. A folder called JS. All right, so again, whenever our server receives a request for let's say localhost column 3000 slash CSS slash main CSS, it will try and see if that CSS slash main CSS is actually available in that public folder and it'll find it here, right? So it's gonna respond with the content of this file immediately, again, bypassing the rest of the stack of middleware. All right, so we're gonna take 
copy the content of the main CSS file. And by the way, all these should be, well, the index HTML and the main CSS should be lowercase. Um, here it's uppercase because uh, probably because it's used as a, uh, as a um, section title. So main CSS as well as index HTML should be lowercase. So let's go back to our CSS file and add this basic CSS styling. What this means is very simply, um, we're basically saying that the entire HTML and body markup is gonna occupy the complete, all the available height of your browser, right? Um, that's what we specify here. Um, dot fill is a class that we're gonna use for, for the, um, for the site, sidebar and the viewer to basically say that that div container um, with this class called fill will occupy the entire viewer height, that's the 100 VH, minus 100 pixels because we want to keep 100 pixels at the top for the toolbar. And you know, a few more basic adjustments for um, a buckets element that's going to be in the HTML and Forge Viewer itself. All right, that's all for our styling. And we can move on to the two JavaScript files. First of all, the forge tree.js. Let me copy the content of that file into clipboard and create this forge tree.js file under our JS folder. Now this time these two are uppercase. So uppercase F and T forge tree.js. All right, and let's take a quick look at what this file is going to do, right? So again, we don't need to include it in the HTML in any other way. It's already being included by, by this script tag, right? So as soon as the index, index HTML page is loaded, it will make another request back to our server asking for some file on the address localhost 3000 slash JS slash forge tree JS and our static middleware on, in our express server. We'll try and see if this JS slash forge tree JS file maybe exists in our public folder and it will find it there. So it, it'll send it right back to the HTML, to, to the browser, to the client. And here's what this JavaScript will do. First of all, you'll notice this maybe strange looking um, construct, this dollar document ready. Uh, we're using jQuery, so anytime you want to create a jQuery wrapper object for any HTML element, um, you just wrap, you just call it as a dollar function with that element inside as a parameter. So here we're basically saying document is just a standard HTML reference to a, um, a page document page. Um, so we're basically calling this dollar function on it to wrap it into a jQuery object, and on that object we we're calling dot ready, which means um, add an event listener to this document object to when it's ready. And then when it's ready, do something, right? And whatever you want to do, you pass in as a function to the ready, to the ready method. So we're basically saying as soon as the document is loaded and ready, execute this, this code. And what we're doing here is um, we're basically here again, you know, getting a reference to an, an HTML element on that page with ID refresh buckets. And we're adding a click event handler saying, okay, when we click on it, um, get the reference to, get a reference to an add buckets HTML element, activate this jQuery tree plugin on it and refresh it, right? So this is another way of activating um, jQuery plugins, typically, uh, when you include some plugin for jQuery, like in this case, JS3, you activate that plugin by calling its name as a method on a jQuery object. So here we're basically saying, okay, create a jQuery wrapper for an HTML element on the page that's called add buckets. So here if in the HTML, if we look for add buckets, this is it, right? This is our div, which right now doesn't contain anything, but we're gonna let this JavaScript, the JS3, plugin populate its contents with some data. Um, 
right? And then similarly, we set up another click event handler for another element on the page called create new bucket. That will most likely be a button. So create new bucket C is a button. So we're basically saying, okay, create a jQuery wrapper, add a click event handler, and when, when it's clicked, call this create new bucket function. Now we're now we're actually getting to this interesting part where our JavaScript on the client side will be communicating with our server with the custom endpoints that we've defined for our server, right? So what happens here is when somebody clicks on the create new bucket um, button, we're gonna retrieve any value from an element on the HTML called, in this case called new bucket key. So if we search for new bucket key, you'll see that this is an HTML input where we're gonna be asking the user to enter the name of the bucket. Um, with this line of code, we're gonna retrieve that value that the user entered. And we're gonna try and make a post request to our server to this probably now familiar already to you, um, URL slash API slash forward slash OSS slash buckets. This is you know, the endpoint we've defined earlier that's gonna be used um, to create new buckets. So we're gonna, we, we, we're, here we're basically using jQuery to make that request to the server, to this specific URL. We're saying that the content of the body that we're sending is gonna be encoded as a JSON, right? And then the JSON, we're actually stringifying it and we're sending it as a data, right? So we're calling this built-in method json.stringify to take an actual object and turn it into a JSON string and that we send to the server uh, so that it can then run the logic for creating the bucket. And then uh, in jQuery, the way this works when you're making um, requests to, to server, um, you can also provide you know, success or error callback. So functions that should be called depending on whether that request was handled successfully or not. So if it's successful, again, what we do is we just get, get a jQuery wrapper for our empty diff activate the JS3 jQuery plugin on it, and we call refresh, right? Because we want to refresh that, um, that tree with, um, so that it now includes the newly created bucket. Um, and if there was a problem, we see here, uh, we specifically check if the status of the error was 409, which is the um, uh, name clash. We're gonna show an alert to the user saying, bucket name already exists, right? Otherwise, and then for all the other cases, we just log the error to the console. All right. And finally, there is this longer piece of code. Um, so we're adding a change event handler to another element called hidden upload field. If we search for hidden upload field, you'll see that this is again an input, but this time it's not of type text, but it's of type file. So this is the way in HTML for you to define an input where users can click a button, have the browser open a file browser for them so that they can look for a file somewhere on their file system, choose a file and then, for example, upload it. So what we do here is we include this input, but we hide it by default. You can see we're specifying the visibility as hidden here in a style attribute. So that means that this input element will be available on the HTML page, but it will not be visible. You will not see the actual um, field with a file name with a, a button next to it that would allow you to um, select a file. Instead, what we do is um, when we detect, well, we actually we actually trigger this change event um, in this HTML input field programmatically um, in a in a different area of this code um, through a context menu actually here. So maybe let me skip to that first. So we have this uh, helper function here as well at the bottom called prepare at bucket tree. That one is called as soon as the document is ready, right? Um, and what this does is, again, it activates the JS3 jQuery plugin on this app buckets diff in our HTML so that it's populated with um, some 
buckets and objects, right? Um, in this case, you could find the documentation for this JS3 plugin. The way it works is that you can specify how it should retrieve um, the data for itself, right? How the tree should populate itself. Um, one of the ways is by providing a URL where the tree plugin can query data in certain format. That is actually what we're doing in our OSS router. This structure here, where you know when somebody requests, makes a request to API Forge OSS buckets, you might have noticed earlier that we're returning the data in this special format. It's JavaScript objects with properties like ID, text, type, and children. The reason we're returning the data in this shape is exactly because of the JS3 plugin, because that's the shape of data it expects if you just want to pass it a URL, right? In this case, the plugin will keep making requests to this URL, and it will expect the response to be a JSON with ID, type, and children, for example, or text property. Um, and yeah, so this way, this is really all that's needed to create a jQuery tree that will be automatically populated by requesting some JSON data from our server, specifically from this URL. And then the other settings are really uh, more visual, right? So here we're specifying types of icons to use depending on whether what we're showing is a bucket or an object. Then you can also load some additional plugins. The one we're gonna use here is called context menu. So this is a way for you to specify the right click menu that should appear when you right click on one of the objects in the tree. Uh, in this case, we're calling audit as custom menu function that will return again, <clears throat> some menu items depending on the node that, you, that the user clicked on, or right clicked on. So here, what we say, we basically check, okay, if the type of the node that we're, that the user right clicked on is a bucket, we're gonna return a set of um, actions where there's really just a single single action that's gonna be called you know, upload file. And when the user clicks on it, we're gonna call this upload file um, function. And then if the user right clicks on an object, we're gonna show again, a menu with just one item and that's gonna be called translate. And this is where we're gonna call you know, a, func a helper function called translate object where we make the request to our model derivative express router to actually start the translation. Now, going back to where we end, you know, where we ended earlier, the hidden upload field, that's the input HTML element for file uploads that is hidden. And what we do here is basically when you right click on one of the buckets and you hit the upload object action item or menu item, we programmatically simulate a click on this hidden upload field input element, right? So this, this input is again hidden and it, it's only activated programmatically when you right click on the tree on one of the buckets and say upload, upload file. That's when we invoke, invoke this file input. So in that case, the browser will open a dialogue, please choose a file you will choose a file in your file system, right? And then you'll be able to upload it. And for translation, again, when, you, when the user right clicks on one of the objects, we have configured here that the right click menu is gonna show one option called translate. And when, you, when the user clicks on that menu item, we make a request to our server, this time to API Forge model derivative jobs Right? Again, sending payload in form of a JSON with the bucket key, that's the key where the object is stored and the bucket and the object name. Uh, this is where, this is the actual name of the file that we've uploaded to that bucket, right? So we turn, take these two properties, turn them into a JSON object, send it off to our, to our um, API Forge model derivative jobs handler. We can double check it here. Right, this is the one that we're gonna call from our client side. Um, and in the request body, you'll see that 
we're checking the object name here. So it looks like in this case, it's actually the only the only uh, payload input that is read is the object name, not the bucket name. So we take the URN, which will already include the object name, which will already include the, uh, the URN. That's the unique base64 encoded ID of the object in Forge that you want to start processing with your model to relative service. All right. That's it for the Forge tree file. That's the logic for managing the behavior of the sidebar with the tree. And in the second part, we can take a look at the Forge viewer. That one's going to be simpler. So let me once again copy the content of that file into clipboard and create Forge viewer file again with uppercase F and uppercase V, Forge viewer.js in our JS subfolder. In this case, uh, this JavaScript file just defines a global variable called viewer. This is where we're going to store the reference to Forge viewer itself. Um, and it provides a couple of helper functions that are called from the tree, actually. So we have a function here called launch viewer that expects, again, this base64 encoded ID of an object that we want to load. We call it in the model derivative service terminology, it's called URN. Um, so it expects this string, um, URL safe string, um, identif uniquely identifying the design in Forge that you want to load. And it calls this autodesk.viewing.initializer. It's an initializer function that will download all the dependencies for the Forge viewer, right? So Forge viewer itself depends on a couple more libraries for, for internationalization internationalization and it depends on 3js for some of the basic 3d classes and it may require some additional images for environment maps for example um, so calling this autodesk .viewing initializer function will make sure that all these dependencies are available on that web page before we actually try and instantiate the viewer in a callback by the way these namespaces, autodesk.viewing dot something something something, are available, and we can call them here because we included the viewer three D .js or viewer three D .js file in our in the head of our uh, page in our HTML marker. This is this is the JavaScript that defines all these namespaces and all these classes. So once the initializer is once the initialization is complete, and we have all the dependencies available and loaded. In the callback function, we create a new instance of Autodesk viewing GUI viewer 3D, right? That's the actual object that will represent the 3D, the, the canvas that shows either the 3D views or the 2D drawings of your designs from Forge. So you'll want to let it know where in the HTML it should sit, right? So this, in this case, we're saying, okay, it should sit inside an HTML element called Forge Viewer. We go to back to the HTML and search for Forge Viewer. Here it is, right? So it's an empty div for now. And again, we've we've uh, given it a size that will then be fully occupied and used by the Viewer library itself. And then you can also pass some additional properties when instantiating the Viewer, like for example, list of Viewer extensions that you want to load with it. Um, we will talk more about extensions on Thursday, viewer extensions, and then we start the viewer. That's it. So now it's loaded, it's initialized, but of course, for now, still without any design, without any 3D view or 2D ROM. That we load later, uh, right now, uh, right after that, by calling this Autodesk viewing document load method passing the URN that we retrieved, that we received as a parameter to our launch viewer function. And when, when calling this document.load method, you basically want to specify two callback functions. One that should be called if everything went, was successful and the other one that should be called if there was any problem, right? So what we say is after the document is loaded, if the loading was successful, we're providing a function called in document load success, which is right here. We say we get the default 
viewable the default geometry from the design because be careful because when you let's say upload a Revit model, the model derivative service can extract multiple viewables as we call them from it, right? It can, gener it can extract multiple 2D views, 2D sheets, multiple 3D views. So you'll want to either choose which of these 2D sheets or 3D views you want to open or you want to, you, you want to get the, the default, which is what we're getting here. So we're choosing the default viewable or default geometry, and we're calling viewer dot load document node. This is where we actually say, okay, and now Forge Viewer, you go and start downloading assets from Forge to load the SVF file for this document. And if the document loading does not succeed, we log an error to the console. All right, that's for loading loading models into the viewer. And finally, you may have noticed before calling the Autodesk Viewing Initializer, we're also specifying a couple of top level um, options where we say, for example, the environment with which we should communicate, whether it's uh, w whether we want to talk to Forge staging environment or Forge production, which is here. Uh, for the production environment. And the very important part of these options that sort of like circles back to what we worked during the second session and really really just you know, ties it up is this get access token. So as I was explaining earlier today, the viewer cannot just go to Forge and start downloading SVF files of arbitrary models that other people uploaded. And, and load them and show them to you, right? The viewer needs to authenticate itself with some kind of token. That is what we're using the public token for. Uh, if you remember when we were working on the authentication endpoints or on the authentication express router, we define this logic for this one URL, which is API Forge OAuth token. Right? And when somebody makes a get request to that URL, our server will retrieve the public token, that's the one, that's the token with just one scope, which is viewables read. That token cannot do anything else. So it's safe to share it with the client, with the browser. And we send that token in a JSON to the client, right? And this endpoint is exactly what we're using in this Forge Viewer JavaScript file. We're basically saying, as we're in, uh, initializing Forge Viewer, we're saying, Hey, Forge Viewer, whenever you will need a new access token, here's the function to call. And the viewer will just call this function for the first time. It'll keep using the access token that the function returns. And let's say an hour later, if it detects that the token has already expired, it will call this function again, right? And the function will do, will do nothing else than just you know, call a fetch, which is another built-in function in JavaScript in the browser that allows you to make web requests. So this API Forge OAuth token. And then when it receives the token, it just calls this callback method that the viewer will provide. So it will say, okay, whenever the viewer calls this get forge token uh, function, we will talk to our server. We will ask it to generate a new public access token for us. And when it's ready, we're gonna let the viewer know with this callback function. And that is, that is it. And with that, um, our application is ready. So now let's give it a try. I run my app and head over to localhost 3000. Now we should already see the HTML, right? Because in this case, the browser will try and ask the server for the default page, the index HTML. And our static middleware in our Express application will return um, that HTML, right? So that this is it. This is our basic interface, um, right? We have our new bucket, um, a new uh, new bucket button here. If I if I click it, we open a new modal dialog that's provided by Bootstrap, where we can specify the name of our bucket. So again, the bucket must be unique, but here. In this particular application, you don't have to worry about the uniqueness that much, right? Because if you remember any bucket name that I enter here and I hit the go ahead, create a bucket button, by the time this bucket name reaches our server side code, 
we will prefix it here, right? This is where we're, we're gonna receive the bucket name that was entered into that uh, modal dialog. But our service side code will prefix it with our client ID anyways, right? So there is a good chance that even if I enter something like test, let's actually try that, All right? And maybe put a breakpoint, oops, put a breakpoint in here. So if I enter just simply test, all right, now we've intercepted the request to our server. So you can see that in our body, the JSON body, right? The name that we entered in the user interface is simply test. But before we create the bucket, we actually prefix it with our client ID. So the final name of the bucket will look like this. This is my client ID dash test. So it's very likely that this bucket name does not exist yet. So I'll let I'll, I'll let the code run, and now the JavaScript client side logic has has already refreshed the tree, so it now appears with two two buckets, right? And again, if I if I open the Dev Tools just to indicate that this is really how it works, uh, reload the page, you will notice that this tree plugin makes requests to our custom endpoints like the like the buckets, right? So if I search for buckets, so you'll see that first this, uh, this tree plugin for jQuery made a request to HTTP localhost API Forge OSS buckets with ID being just a hash sign. And our server responded with, with this. Yes, there's two buckets, right? This is what the server sent back to the browser. And the tree plugin based on these two values in the array build these nice uh, folder icons and these you know these two nodes in the tree but of course then it also went ahead the tree plugin went ahead and asked okay so now give me all the objects in this petter browse for training bucket and our server returned of course for now nothing and then the plugin also asked okay now give me all the children in the other in the you know client id dash test bucket and our server said you know there's nothing there that's fine so now what we can do is we can right click one of these buckets let's say upload file let's say this one and say upload file this is when we programmatically trigger the click event on that file input html element right so now it's the app is actually the browser is actually asking us for some design file that we want to um upload and preview. So I've got a couple of sample files here. Let's say I'm gonna try maybe, uh, maybe this, uh, one of the official Revit samples. So now we're, see, this is a pending request. We're making a post request to API Forge OSS objects. We're uploading a file and when it's uploaded, um, we're gonna refresh, refresh the tree when it's ready. So it's still going. It's possible that um, that file I chose was a little bit larger, so it may take longer. So now we're basically here, right? Now we're receiving, receiving a file from the client, and you can see that the server side code had already created this temporary uploads file, right? So. Um, this is, this is the file that was uploaded to us from the browser. Um, and here, what we did is we took that file and we now we're uploading it to Forge Data Management Service. All right, so it succeeded, right? So it took a little bit longer. We can check it here. That request took 35 seconds. And in the response, oh, there was no response, but the but the response header said that the status of the operation was 200 okay. So the upload was successful. And you can, you can notice that now the tree plugin for jQuery actually shows this expanding arrow here. So we can expand the folder and see our uploaded Revit file there. But now when we actually try and view it, we get this, right? 
Um, so what happens here is when we try and load the model for the first time, oh yeah, open it for the first time, the Forge Viewer logic here in the JavaScript code that we've added, it checks, it asks Forge first whether that file has already been processed. And if not, it just shows this, you know, little message saying, okay, this file hasn't been translated yet, start translation. Or in the same way, you can right click the object in the tree and you will get the same translate option. So when we do that, once again, we can open the network tab just to see. Once we click the translate button or the menu item, see, this is where the browser makes a post request to, again, <clears throat> one of our server-side endpoints, this time to API Forge model derivative jobs, right? This is where we're asking our server to start the translation process for this specific Revit model. Now, See, there's a little helpful, help, uh, helpful message asking us to try again in a moment. So what we can try is click, just left click the Revit model one more time, okay? So now the viewer asked, you can actually see here when you select an object in the tree, the JavaScript code in the, in, uh, in the HTML page checks the Forge service itself. So see here, this request goes directly to developer API auditor.com slash model derivative v2 da 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 design data something slash manifest. This is a request that you can make directly to Forge to find out the status of processing of a specific file, right? So in this case, the response said, okay, the translation is in progress right? And the progress is 0% complete. Now, if we click it again, the file has already been translated. So when we ask for the manifest again, it'll say, okay, complete. And so our JavaScript code on the, on the HTML page will open the model and you're ready to, to play with it. And again, to explain, to expand more on what we were saying earlier about the model derivative service, you don't just get the the 3D view, right? You get all the 2D sheets and all the 3D views that were defined for this specific Revit model. And going back to our Forge Viewer JavaScript file, you've, you may have noticed that, you know, as the additional properties when instantiating the viewer itself, we've added this extensions property with a list of a single string, which is Autodesk.document browser. This is the name of one of the built-in viewer extensions that you can load on demand, right? The viewer comes with some viewer extensions that are enabled by default. Those are things like the measure tool, right? That you can use to take, to take measurements or that comes, uh, or the section tool is also loaded as a viewer extension. That is something you can use to slice through your model. Um, but you can also activate other built-in extensions that are not enabled by default. And Autodesk.document browser is one of them. It's a very helpful extension for the viewer that adds an extra button to the toolbar. Looks like this, it's this folder icon. And what it allows you to do is it'll basically give you a list of all the 3D views and 2D sheets that are available for that specific file that, you wanna, that we've loaded into the viewer. So here you can see that, you know, as the default geometry, it loaded this 3D view, but you can see that there's actually a couple more 2D sheets as well. And you can switch to them uh, from here, from this, from this document browser panel directly, right? So it's, it's kind of nice to be able to, you know, so that you don't have to go back to your code and change the logic here, right? Where, we choose the default geometry, maybe we would need to hard code some ID of one of the 2D sheets. You don't have to do that, right? You can just use the document browser extension in the viewer to get this nice interface of all the outputs that were extracted for this Revit model um, by the Forge model derivative so, so service. Including, yeah, you can also get a preview with thumbnails. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, of course, you also get the, you know, the model hierarchy, right? So in, in case of Revit models, it's, you know, Revit families and instances. 
So you, you can get a very nice overview of, of the different design elements. Uh, if you were working with, let's say, an inventor file in the model browser, you would see the actual hierarchy of components and parts. And finally, um, the really important part is the properties, right? So you can also open this properties dialog. And then when you select individual elements in the design, you will basically see all the different properties that were defined for those particular elements by that by the authoring application in this case Revit, right but even for again for other file types the forge model derivative service will still try and extract as much information about the individual elements as possible all right and that wraps it up for our basic forge application let me stop the app locally and let's move on to questions. All right. There's a question. Uh, could you show how to code erasing a bucket on the public side? Okay. Um, so once again, as we discussed earlier, Right, <clears throat> I would not recommend sending an access token to the client that would allow you to delete buckets, right? Because that basically means sharing an access token with a client, a secret that could potentially be stolen, that would have the power to delete buckets. Um, that's not ideal, right? Because again, if it's not likely, but again, if somebody got hold of that access token, they would have a limited window of time during which they could actually delete your application's buckets, um, which again is not something you want, right? Um, so for that, I would recommend using the same approach as we use with you know creation of buckets and uploading of files. What you could do here is you could create another endpoint or another um, handle for, let's say, a delete request. You could say router.delete um, buckets. And let's say um, bucket name. And we create our async fat arrow function. That's what it's called in JavaScript. And this is, so uh, this, uh, this column, I don't think it was used anywhere else in, or you know what? Yeah, yeah, let, let's, yeah, yeah, let's leave it that way. This syntax is something that Express uses for variable parts of your URL, right? So if anyone makes a request to, um, oops, delete API forge OSS buckets foo, this variable will be named, the variable called name will be resolved as foo, right? That's how you specify these variable parts of your URLs. Uh, so I'm gonna say delete a bucket. Okay, now what we can do is um, just have a try catch. That's a good practice to do whenever you're working with async await in Node.js. If there's any error, good practice is to call the next, next function, which again means um, if I'm not able to handle this request for any reason, I'm just gonna pass the request down to other middlewares in the stack. And it's very likely that this request will not be processed by any other stack uh, middleware. So it'll go to the default. It'll end up here, right? Returning an error, basically saying, okay, I did not understand this request or I was not able to process it properly. Cool. And now here, what you can do is let's just create a new instance of buckets API, right? Just like we did here. We just created a new instance of buckets API and called the create bucket directly over here to make it, you know, read a little bit easier. I'm going to say await API delete bucket. And you can see that in case of the Forge SDKs, they are actually written in TypeScript and transpiled, and I believe, and they come with IntelliSense here as well, right? So 
as, as soon as I type API dot, Visual Studio Code will tell me that, okay, there is a couple of methods available on that instance of the buckets API class. One of them is delete bucket, right? So it's going to ask for, okay, what's the, what's the key? What's the name of the bucket that I want to delete, right? And in this case, I would say reg params that name because reg that params is a dictionary of all the variables that were resolved from this syntax, right? Maybe I'll call it like this to make it more clear or maybe like that. Right, so we're basically saying, okay, somebody made this request, whatever value they used after slash bucket slash I'm going to use that value as the name of the bucket that we want to delete, right? And, and again, we need to pass in an authentication client and the token. And for that, we can just copy and paste, right? The requests, uh, the, the custom properties that we've added to our request at the top with this generic middleware function. Okay, so now we have our delete endpoint ready for deleting buckets. Right. And then also if we're successful, we can just return an empty response with status 200, meaning everything went okay. Everything went well. All right, so that's all we need on the server side, right? And now we could call this, uh, we could call this endpoint from any third party HTTP client or from command line. But now here we can try and um, call it from within the UI. So let me go back to our public JavaScript files to the forge tree and find the function where we're specifying the, uh, the right click context menu items, right? And that was here. So if somebody clicks on right clicks on a bucket, for now we only show one action and that is upload file. But now we can add another action, we can call it delete object and the name of that item is going to be delete bucket maybe i'm sorry it should be delete bucket not object it doesn't make sense and action something right we we will want to do something when the user hits that um, menu item now i'm not i'm not sure if there's any what would be the right icon name for that. I'm just going to use the same upload icon for now um, to do, right? So as, as soon as somebody clicks on that delete bucket menu item, for now, we're just going to trigger an alert <clears throat> just to make sure that everything works as expected. Now let's go back to our, oops. Oh, Shakira, look at that. Loka, perfect. That's exactly what I'm listening to. All right. Now if we right click on a bucket, see, we have a second option, delete bucket. And that for now will just trigger a, um, an alert. All right. Um, finally, now what we could do, let's try something. I believe we should be able to when the item is clicked, we should be able to retrieve some information about the, the tree node where the action was triggered on. So let me restart the page, uh, restart the app. And if I right click and say delete bucket, and look at the console. Okay, this is the object. See, this is the console log where I'm basically trying to see what was passed to my function as the first parameter. And it's, it's here, right? This is the, the, um, the item and the element on which I believe this is the one. No? Maybe not, let me see if there's a... Uh, da, da, da. So this is just the events. Try it one more time. So maybe the the item is passed in as the second second object. Delete. No? Okay. So let me check. Where do we find out 
which file we want to, um, which item in the tree we clicked on. Uh, let's see, custom menu. To do upload file. Here, okay. Ah, here, this is the one, right? So in our code, we're actually retrieving the currently selected object um, this way. So let's use it in our own action. So we're gonna say, const node equals jQuery object for add buckets activating JS3 plugin and get selected. So this is what this is how we're going to retrieve the currently selected um, element in the tree, right? So if I right click on a bucket, say delete bucket, we know that this is all the information about that specific node in the tree, right? And the property we need to retrieve from there is the ID, right? This is the name, this is the complete name of the bucket that we will probably want to delete. So what we can do now is we can make a fetch request to slash API slash forward slash OSS slash buckets. Was it right? I believe that's how we define that delete route. API port always says buckets. Well, actually the bucket plus bucket name, right? So this is gonna be plus node.id. So we're making a request to API port always says bucket slash name of the bucket. And here we're gonna specify that um, the method of that request is gonna be not get or post or put, it's gonna be the delete, all right? And that's pretty much it. I think what, one final piece we can do here is just um, refresh the tree. So, do, do, do. we refresh the tree right after deleting the bucket. For now here, I'm not checking whether the operation is successful or not. I'm just gonna assume that yes, it will be you know, executed properly. So let me put a breakpoint inside our delete uh, endpoint handler. Restart the app one more time and let's give it a try. So I'm gonna right click one of my buckets. I'm gonna say delete bucket. Boom, see now we've intercepted this call to our delete um, endpoint handler. Reg.params should include all the parsed variables from the URL. So here you see that we do have bucket name, which was retrieved from the complete URL, right? So we're gonna call delete bucket and this bucket name. By the way, actually now I'm thinking it, it may fail. And let's see if you if you know why. Boom, it fails. Okay. Forbidden. 403 forbidden. Now, I'll give you a little bit of time if you, if you if you know why why this fails. You may already know. Uh, the reason for that is the token that we're the internal token that we're using for for um, this operation, right? We're using the same internal token as everywhere else that token actually does not have the privilege to delete buckets. If you look back at all the scopes we've de defined for this internal token, we've defined, we've allowed it to create buckets and read buckets, but not to delete buckets, right? So that's why, that's why um, the operation failed. And to, to remedy that, what you can do, what you should always do is um, go to the documentation documentation, data management service. And let's find the documentation for the request that we're trying to make to delete a bucket. 
here. All right, this is the this is the method we're trying to call. I mean, under the hood, it's just an HTTP request, right, made on our behalf. But uh, this is really what the Forge SDK is doing under the hood. And you'll notice here that the required OAuth scopes are bucket delete. That's the one we're missing there. So let's go back, and I'm gonna add a new scope to my list of internal scopes for my internal token and reload the app. And now we can go back to our application, reload it, right click our test bucket and say delete. We've intercepted the call on, on the server side, boom, and our bucket was deleted. And there we are, the bucket is gone. All right, um, I saw there were a couple more questions um, in the meantime, but it looks like uh, Deepali took care of those. So thank you very much for that. All right, any other questions? If I can share the code, um, Oh, you mean the code for um, deleting the bucket? Okay, uh, ba -ba -ba. let's see what would be the best way to share that with you. Um, ba -ba -boom. <laughs> All right, there really, really isn't that much, I think. Um, so maybe I can just copy and paste this. Um, delete handler to, to the chat for everyone to see. Or maybe GitHub. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of thinking it maybe doesn't make sense for this minor change to, to be, you know, to be committed to GitHub as a, as a complete project, maybe as a gist. Uh, but maybe that's what I'm going to do. Uh, bo -bo -bo. All right, let's see. Um, all right, so I'm going to create a new gist where I'm going to modify i'm going to mention the modifications you'll want to do to the oss js file right um so this is going to be this extra router delete handler then you'll want to modify the config as well to make sure that the bucket delete scope is included there right um, here let me just that is to indicate that this is this should be just added to your existing OSS JavaScript file. Um, and what did we do on the client side? Yep, we just okay. Let me I just update it. Oh, that's custom menu um, function. So that would be in the forge tree chance. Right, so this is the updated Autodesk custom menu function that says that when you right click on a bucket, apart from the upload file option, there's also going to be a delete bucket option that will just retrieve the node that was right clicked on. Maybe we can delete this guy and it will just make this delete request asking our server to delete that bucket for us. All right. Yeah, I think that's create a secret just now, a public just. Yes, now, ah, there we are. All right, and let me copy and paste this into the chat. All right, so if, if in case anyone is interested in this additional functionality that we've just added on top of the basic app, 
um, you know, right click menu item for deleting buckets, um, you'll find it in this GitHub just that I just shared in the chat. All right. Any other questions? Oh, you're welcome, Vinny. If not, um, now again is your turn to give this a try. Um, I will stay online for some time. So now there is no more like a, an hour gap. Now just, uh, you know, you give it a try, uh, wrap up the, the client side piece with the HTML file <clears throat> and uh, the two JavaScript for the client. Um, see if you can get everything working. And if not, I'll be here and, um, to answer, answer your questions. And as a, as a wrap up, um, so this, this was our, you know, this, the basic tutorial we covered today was really, um, again, a very simple introduction into the Forge world and Forge development. Um, tomorrow on Wednesday, we're gonna look at um, <clears throat> a slightly similar type of application, but instead of an app that allows you to upload custom files and translates them for you. Uh, we will build an application that will allow you to access your existing content and existing designs in other applications built on top of Forge, such as BIM 360 Docs or Fusion Team. Um, that that's gonna be the topic for tomorrow. And again, there are two parallel tracks, one for Node.js uh, that I'm gonna be leading and one for .NET that my colleague Adam is gonna lead. On Thursday, we're gonna have a shared session uh, so no matter whether you're using .NET or Node.js on the server side, on Thursday, we're going to be looking at how the viewer can be customized and extended and used in more you know, advanced applications with, with stuff like dashboards. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing, what the, the session, um, I'm going to lead that session on Thursday. And Friday, my colleagues will um, guide you through that advanced use case of using the Forge Design Automation Service which again is that service that allows you to process your designs with your custom Revit plugin or AutoCAD plugin or Inventor plugin or 3ds Max script remotely in our Ford, on our Ford servers without you having to have Revit or Inventor or AutoCAD installed. That's gonna be the topic for Friday. All right, <clears throat> for additional support, um, officially, we're, we're trying to be very active on Stack Overflow. So if you have any questions that are not, um, you know, some uh, secret IP, um, if, if there are typical technical questions around, you know, the platform or any of its specific components, <clears throat> we encourage you to ask on Stack Overflow. A good chance is that, you know, Somebody had already asked that question before and it's maybe already answered there. If not, um, if, when you ask your question there, we're gonna get a notification in our internal ticketing system. <clears throat> and one of us will jump on that topic, jump on that question and provide an answer as soon as possible. That's for general um, technical topics, right? That might be helpful for others as well to get the answer for. If you do have any proprietary, um, any proprietary questions or something that maybe requires you to share your, uh, your design files that are, that should be protected and not shared with anyone. In that case, uh, feel free to contact us on forge.help at autodesk.com. And I don't have that here in my slides, but when you go to the uh, portal, forge.autodesk.com, to the section called get help support get help basically when you submit your questions through here um you'll be um this will go to our forge.help at other.com email that will also trigger a notification in our system so we know that somebody is asking question through the email or through stack overflow and we can um we can get to you um again as soon as we can based on our availability <clears throat> All right, and that is it for our presentation today. So now is your time to 
to follow my steps for the final session and implement the client side piece for your Forge application. And again, I'm going to be here for a bit more to answer your questions in, in case you run into any problems. So with that, thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed the, this guided, guided tutorial. And uh, regarding the recordings, as I mentioned, they will be <clears throat> they will be shared with all of you, with everyone who registered uh, after the event. So probably maybe Friday evening or early next week at the latest. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. All right. So let me stop the recording.